This is Gene Adam, former lead singer of Iced Earth. Be sure to subscribe to Podcast and Stone. And don't forget, join our community on social media. Metal lives. Ladies and gentlemen of the Ice Earth community, welcome to Podcast in Stone, the only podcast 100% dedicated to Iced Mother Fucking Earth. I am joined, as always, with the incomparable Chuck Hoskins. It's Christmas time, and what is the best time to bring everyone for Christmas? That's right, John Schaefer. What a great <laughs> Christmas present. Uh, John. Welcome back That's to the scary. show, man. That's a scary thought. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come down over Santa Claus. Yeah, <laughs> the motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome good back, John. It's great to have you on here again. That's good to be here, man. How are you guys? All good? Well, it's, been a, it's been a good year, yeah. I'm good. Anxiously awaiting December the 21st. Does that date mean anything to you? Yeah, man, it's it's a fun thing, you know. It was was that was a the purgatory project was really fun, and uh, you know, you guys were largely responsible for that. You know, it's it's funny how everything has has happened, you know, and how fast it happened, and you know, because I I just being an old school guy, it never occurred to me to search out people on Facebook to try to do a contact. It just never. It's just not the way, you know, I grew up where you had to actually call people, you know, and you had to have their phone number and people move and then they have a different phone number. And it's like, and you just get out of touch. And I never had an email address from Gene. We were together before there was email. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? When, when In our world, that just didn't exist. So none of that, we didn't have those kind of contacts. And it's not like if I would have ever seen Gene in an Iced Earth show, I would have been so happy to see him, you know, but you don't. You don't think about the stuff. So when what, when you guys did that interview, it ended up being such a cool thing to bring us together again. And uh, and then for this thing, to, the music thing to happen, is, which was so organically. I mean, it, we were going there just to talk and to have some laughs. And it just felt so cool. And I'm like, hey, maybe we should record some of those songs, you know, not thinking we're going to be doing that in three months. But Gene and Bill are going, yeah, but we're 55 and dude, if you wait much longer, I'm going to be walking into the fucking studio on a walker or whatever, you know, they were joking about, it. I'm like, all right guys, but look, I don't have any time for like the next year and a half. And Hansi's relying on me to get going on demons. And we had our ice earth activities to fulfill. So I was, I just said, I've got this window of opportunity. It's, I had two weeks off in between the European winter tour and the, the North American winter tour. And we did this uh, production in nine days. You know, I mean, that's not a, that's not a normal thing uh, that you could do with unless there was really seasoned pros happening in the project because you, you know, getting in, knowing that uh, Mark Prater is, he's a professional session drummer and a recording engineer. So you, and an amazing drummer on top of that, <laughs> one of my favorites right. in the world to jam with. There's just something about jamming with Mark. It's like fucking awesome because I'm a rhythm dude, man. So when you're playing with a, with a guy who plays like a fucking grown man and nails that groove, it's like, oh, you know what I mean? It's the it's the epitome. <laughs> when you're a real rhythm guy, which I am, that it just doesn't get better than locking in with a drummer like that. So I knew, you know, when I was like, okay, guys, I have this window of opportunity. I gotta gotta put together a team that can make it happen. And there's a lot, obviously, with everybody there being in Tampa, it didn't make any sense for everybody to fly to Independence Hall to to do this project. I mean, there was, there's no point in that. It would have made the budget go sideways and would have been crazy. So we did, we programmed the drums at Jim's house. And then I came home and in one evening I, I stacked the rhythm guitar stuff, had that ready to go. And then whatever point I was able to get back down to Florida, um, which may have just been a few days later. I don't remember exactly how it went down, but we went down and then we started and Mark, Mark played to my pre-recorded guitar tracks and then, you know, we, uh, we went from there and we just started layering the parts. So, but it, it, it's just a, an amazing turn of events that happened so fast. And then, you know, the thing's been done and Bill and Gene have been chomping at the bit wanting to tell people about it, but I'm like, no, let's wait because it's a surprise. Nobody's going to see this coming. It's going to be a cool thing. 
we wanted to try to get it out by Halloween, but my schedule became so insane that I couldn't finalize what it is. We, at the point that we did this, we didn't know what we were going to do with it. It was just a fun thing to do. And um, I played it for some people and my old product manager, or my he's, he is technically my product manager at Century Media, even though Ice Earth is not signed to them anymore. And we may end up being in the future. It depends. You know, there's a lot of talks going on right now. But I, uh, he loved it. And he's a fan of all eras of Iced Earth. And he just said, man, this is so cool. You know, let us put this out. Let us put it out. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I mean, under a license, that's fine. And with it's it's the first release under my own Ravencraft production, so it's a, which is an imprint. And through Platinum Dragon International, it's a, it's under the umbrella of that company. And so it's, it's a new thing that I'm starting that I wanted to become a, uh, you know, for me, in, that, that I would be involved in anybody's production, not just my own. Um, I have plans at some point to do a consultancy type of situation where instead of a, being a manager type that takes a, a percentage cut of whatever the artist is, it would be the kind of thing where an artist can can call me and we have a consulting situation where I can, that way it's going to be far cheaper for them than the up, and I can give them valuable advice from a long career of finding all the trap doors. <laughs> you know what I mean? So there's, there's one of those, that's one of those things that Ravencraft could be good for is for, you know, any co- consulting on any kind of, uh, aspect of the music business and also for production, you know, if somebody wants me to produce their record, obviously I have to have time. I have to be into the music, but I, that's, that's where that's going. So it's more than just an imprint label. It's a, it's more, it's going to be my vision for it as it would develop over time is something a bit more complex than just being a production company. So That sounds really cool, man. Um, how, how was it, uh, going down memory lane and discovering those old songs and actually like relearning them and stuff well, like that? The, it was it was interesting it was painful to my ears <laughs> because the, i mean we were we were completely full of piss and vinegar i mean we were like we thought we were the greatest in the world and we were not and we were we had this brutal fuck you attitude like i mean it's when i think back the way we were i guess to some degree i'm pretty much still that guy i just I've learned so much and gotten better that maybe I can back it up, <laughs> you know, back then, <laughs> back then we were just getting started and, uh, and we weren't, but, but that's the attitude it took to survive and to thrive in a brutal period of, of the band's history. Um, we had to believe, you know, so but I think back and listen, when I listen to it, it's just, it's that bad. It's that bad that the songs were, had some really cool, parts and the ideas and the and the lyrical content there was a lot of cool shit there we just weren't we were new players so we weren't experienced at how to execute the parts how to make the most of any given arrangement and certainly had no clue what we were doing in the studio back then so i mean those are all things that are you know it's part of the learning experience of doing this everybody start off you know and, and you're in the basement of your house or in a garage and you suck and you get into a room and argue about stuff and you work it out and you practice and you practice and you get better and better. And then every time you go into a recording situation, you, learn. you should learn. If you don't learn something every day in the studio, then you're fucking up. And I mean, even at 50 years old at my age, having done this professionally for three decades, I can tell you that I still learn things in the studio almost daily. And that's whether it's psychology of whoever you're working with, or if it's um, something on my own, you know, that I'm learning. It's it should be. That's so that part of it was a little painful going through those recordings and listen to it because of the memories that it, you know, invoked of what was going on in the day. Hello, Chuck. Does it back. seem? Do I sound better now? Yeah, yeah, it's a bit. Okay. I don't hear any noise okay. now, so that's good. I was just hearing a lot of. <laughs> yeah, it's, shit. it's like someone's juggling with steel or something. Right. I'll put I'll put my steel balls away. Stop <laughs> yeah. <juggling>. yeah, put <laughs> balls later, Chuck. Not now, not during the show. <laughs> not now. <laughs> um. You can't help it. Okay. It's all just on shaking. Um, <laughs> right. 
Now, uh, I just don't make him laugh. Water all over the place. Okay. Um, uh, uh, your Dracula sound. Go ahead, uh, Jason. I was going to say, um, beware of your mic, Chuck, because it's like right on your neck and it does rub against your t-shirt, so that sometimes can create noise. That's why I don't tend to use inline microphones. That's just me. Um, okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, and resume. Okay, John, Dracula sounds absolutely amazing. How hard was it with so many Purgatory songs to select those five, or did it come right away, which ones you wanted? I mean, we discussed, Bill and Gene and I discussed the options, and there, there were a lot of them. The, we felt nostalgia from Jack and Burning Oasis because those were some of the earliest ones. Um, Purgatory, let's see, Jack, Burning Oasis, and, and Jason's Mind, actually, those were automatics, actually. And then we we discussed uh, Dracula was also pretty easy to say, yeah, we should do that one because it was it had I mean, I knew the things that were missing from that song it, from originally, you know, just listening to it through one time. I'm like, wow, that's a pretty bad arrangement. <laughs> but at the time we were like, well, that's so epic, man. Yeah, because we're playing the same thing over and over and over. Pretty fucking epic. It's long, not epic. So, you know, that's, but, so I just made some changes and said, we need to come up with a, with a chorus. Absolutely. Um, so Bill's riff ended up becoming the chorus riff. And then, uh, and then it was just a matter of getting, uh, the verse lengths and stuff like that dialed in and tweaked. And I moved some parts around a little, um, but it, but I knew that was going to end up being a good song. And I, I think all of them are, have some charm to them because it's like, it's really early stuff. I mean, if you go, if you were to listen to the stuff that Greg and I jammed in Indiana when we were still kids, you would find that the main riffs from Storm Rider were being played then. The main riffs from Colors, the main, you know, Jack, Burning Oasis. Uh, there was a, a lot of riffs that we were playing that I was playing and Greg would, whatever, he, at that point he didn't have a drum set. But there were times when we would be around with people that did and we would just start jamming. But he heard me play those things those riffs a lot of times and, and i mean storm rider is a really old song it's an old song idea uh the bridge section got developed later on when we decided to do it for real but we were even doing storm rider when gene was in the band you know a version of it it's not what it ended up being in finality i think the one that was the most discussion about this was which we should do for number five or the discussion was should we do four or five because of budget reasons and i was like well i think I think we're going to be okay to add a fifth one in and in your dreams uh, was one that was later. It was definitely towards the end. That was probably a song that was written in uh, maybe in 87. You know, I can't remember exactly when in 1988 that we changed the name of the band, but that was the year that it happened. I don't know. I don't remember the date, um, but I can, it, it was just the, I guess, some of the things were automatic from a nostalgia standpoint. And then in your dreams was one that was like, well, that can actually be a very cool song with a little bit of work. And I added a couple new sections in there um, just to, to make it a bit more epic. You'll hear it because Friday, the lyric video drops. So for that song. Oh, wow. So, so you'll hear that. Um, and uh, that ended up becoming one of my favorites. It's the one that opens the album. I still very much have love in Jason's mind. And, you know, the, I'm not, a, to be honest, I'm not a big fan of Jack and Burning Oasis because they're so basic and they're so, I'm sorry, man, I'm going to mute my phone. Otherwise it's going to, it'll make a fucking ton of noise. I'm not careful. It's going off like crazy. Um, so like Jack, especially is just, it's super basic, but it's, also kind of charming and it's cool because it, it was one of the first things that we, it might've been the first thing that Bill ever jammed with us. And it was definitely one of the first songs that we played together when we finally, the five of us found each other. And, uh, cause we're, there was jamming, Greg and I jammed with other musicians. I mean, there's pictures of us lined up with guys before Gene and Bill, five guys that were, uh, and, and different ones coming in and out, but you could tell they weren't serious you know so it was like there was it was we weren't going anywhere when we met gene and richard we had a good feeling especially about gene um richard 
we had a good feeling about Richard too, but he was so young. He was still in high school. Actually, he, Greg and I should have been in high school. We quit. We left home and started the band. But um, so Richard was exactly our age and in our same grade, but he was still going to high school. And I, I mean, it, it just, there was a certain, you could feel that there was something happening. You know, he had the place to jam. He was at that time far more talented than, than the four of us, you know, I mean, he was, he was advanced on his instrument compared to us. We were still beginning beginners and he, he had spent a lot of time playing the bass. You could tell just because of his knowledge of the instrument and how, how well he played. Um, and, uh, but you know, it just, there was a chemistry thing going on there and that was really what it was. And we, we jammed, I mean, there were so many, um, so many songs happening at a very fast pace you know ideas were flowing and we had all so we have if we ever do any more recording and i you know purgat i get asked is purgatory going to go on tour no <laughs> absolutely not this is a it's your trip down memory lane it's a fun thing to do with friends but like the last thing i need to do is make my life more complicated and uh hey hang on man i gotta i gotta do something about this or it's gonna drive me crazy is that your end sleep <laughs> yeah, it's emails coming in so I just turned the program off, <clears throat> but so that's, uh, that's one of those things that, uh, that purgatory is, it's gotta be fun, you know, and it, and it was, it was a lot of fun to do that and it's gotta, but we have to see, you know, what happens over the course of the next year or whatever. And if it makes sense for us to do more, because I, I would love to do it. And I know Gene and Bill would too. So we just have to see what happens, man. I mean, it's not, I've got plenty of work cut out for me for the next couple of years and, uh, and beyond really. Um, but if there's a demand and people really enjoy it and I have a hole in the schedule, I'd be happy to do it again. That's nice. right. That's awesome. Like I, I would like to hear, cause the, the biggest surprise, uh, for me, like I've, I've been a Gene Adam defender since, since the first, cause the first album was the, the first I surf album was uh, the first album I heard in 2000, okay. you know, as a 14 year old, influent easily influenced child uh so i've i've always defended as gene adam as like you know one of my favorite singers like in in the history of the band so to to hear him again but like you know you can see how he's kind of developed and progressed and he's still got that fucking shriek that just sounds killer yeah when it's you, even better yeah it's just it blew me away i'm like holy shit this is awesome yeah. all, all yeah. credit to gene man he's he's killer Jane, you're he, awesome, and you know you're awesome. <laughs> he did a great job, and uh, you know the thing is that was so different from now compared. One of the biggest things is, and Gene hasn't been singing metal for a long time, but he, we talked about this early on. I got him behind a microphone at Jim's house just to hear how things could go, and then gave him some pointers, and he had to really start working on his falsetto, which he did because he hadn't sung like that in so long. So he was doing it every day, and he said, "Yeah, man, it's coming back. It's coming back." So I was like, "Cool." Um, but you know, we, I didn't know what I was doing producing records back then. I couldn't really give him direction because I'm just like everybody else in learning in the process and focused on owning my performance. And, you know, I may have thrown out a suggestion or two back in those days, but I couldn't give him solid concrete advice and production advice and what thing, how important things are, because I didn't know yet. So those are, those are things that that I've learned by working with some of the best singers in the world all of these years and spending countless hours in recording studios in the last 30 years, I was able to really give Gene a, a fair shot behind a microphone, you know what I mean? And to yeah. be able to share some knowledge with him and he was open to it and, and it was great. And of course, Jim also. And it's, so it's one of those things where um, we, we did. We had. We had a good time. There was a few times where Gene got stressed out because he was not <laughs> understanding and you know getting kind of pissed at me a little bit. And I'm like, dude, this is the way it is. I got to hammer you because if I don't, in the end, you're not going to be as happy. So you just got to trust me and roll with it, dude. Trust what I'm saying. And so there was a couple times where he was. He had to go outside and kind of his top was ready to blow. And it was like. <laughs> Dude, I'm not picking on you, I swear to God, but if you just trust me and we walk through the fire together, I'm not going to leave you out to hang, but you got to trust me and know that at the end, this is going to really be cool what I'm asking you to do. And, you know, so he, he calmed down and got it and stuff. And it was fun, man. It was a cool, and you know, Gene 
he learned a lot. He learned a lot just in that short couple hours of pre-production that we did and the discussions that we had. And then, uh, and then when we were in the studio doing it and he, you could see the look on his face and he was like, wow, man, you know, like after we would get through one of those hurdles that was difficult, then he would listen to it and he'd be like, fuck, you know, and stuff that he never thought about before. So you're, I'm during the whole process, we were planting seeds with all of these guys that I've worked with. And there's, it's a, it's a process. It opens up and it, it may be that you don't get the fruits of that until later on. Maybe it's the next thing that he records, but now he knows there's, there's a, a method to the madness. And I, so I feel like, um, when we're <clears throat> talking about doing a potential future, uh, purgatory project together, it's you, wait, you ain't seen nothing yet. You know what I mean? Because yeah. there, that was the, that was the first step for Gene to really be recorded in a professional environment with people that know what the fuck's going on and that care and have his back and that want him to do great and to sound great. So it's a different, it's a completely different scenario. And that's why I'm saying if we, I hope we get a chance. I hope there's a demand to do it because not, I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into a project like this, like hours that you never see or the fans never know about that ends up consuming a lot of my time. So I don't want to, I don't want to do it ever unless it's fun. And I'm willing to sacrifice that amount of time that it takes because it's fun to hang out with my old friends. Really, first and foremost, that's the most important thing. If we can do something that excites people and there's people that are into the music, then fuck, let's do that too because that's cool. But I don't want it to ever turn into a stressful situation for any of us that are involved because then it's not worth it. Cause I, if I want to be stressed out, I can go and do things that will actually pay me and get stressed out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So it's one of those, it, it's gotta be fun. That's gotta be the root thing. And, uh, but I, I hope that there will be a reason to do another full length album. We've got plenty of material that we could pick from and put a cool take on it. And, um, I, I think it'd be awesome. And I would love to record Gene again. And I think Gene and I will end up doing some stuff anyway, you know, whether it's, if we end up doing some, uh, do, following the the idea of doing some re-record stuff, then it would be great to have him involved in some of that. Because again, you know, even if we were to do some bonus tracks on, if we do a re-record of the first album and we were to do a couple bonus tracks and and maybe take a few of those tracks and approach them completely differently from a production standpoint, it would be very cool to have Gene making a, a guest appearance or John Greeley or Matt or whatever, any of the guys. You know, it'd be really a, a cool thing to do and. Um, so I've been thinking about that. I just don't know for sure if we're going to be doing the re all of the re-records because it's it's a we're going to test the waters with it. But to make that sort of a commitment, the amount of time because there are so there's so much movement in the demons and wizards world now that is going to it's it's a big thing that's happening. It's a very big thing. I mean, we went the we put the band on sale on a Friday. And by with promoters in Europe, and by Monday we had secured a headline position on the Friday night at Vakken. That's big. That's congratulations for, on that. Thomas. <clears throat> thank you. But for a for a project that hasn't been active since 14, 15 years, and didn't even have a Facebook page, and hasn't performed since 2000. So by the time we're on stage next summer, it'll have been 19 years since we played live. To be securing headline positions and co-headline positions at the biggest festivals in Europe is a Hans and I are going, wow. We knew the demand was good, but and how aggressive all the labels are after the product and they for the new record and stuff and to re-release the back catalog. There's a lot happening and um, that can't be denied. And it, the work is going to happen. So the, digging into, <clears throat> in, excuse me, in the holes of the next couple years, we may dig into one of the re-records as I stress so that we're, we're active in the downtime of Demons and Wizards. Uh, but I, I want to start with Storm Rider. So that's going to be the album that w it, that we will we will do it, and we will do that record. And the reason I want to do that one is because <clears throat> I think that um, the production can be far better. The performances can be better. Uh, that doesn't mean to take away anything from the past. It's all, like I said, this is a learning process. And I know <clears throat> there's people that are the purest and Great. Listen to those records. You can listen to them. They're there. You can listen to them for the rest of your life. The, but for me, um, I know what it can sound like because it's going on here. So I know what the end result's going to be. And I know just the fact that Storm Rider is a, uh, uh, 
badass concept album that what we can do from a packaging standpoint storyline with the different artwork and with having Dave and Roy on board and really contributing to the vision, getting it. And we have such a great chemistry between the three of us of, of making really cool products and artwork that to have the, the storm rider story unfold in all its glory artistically within the booklet and to have it, have it really nailed down from a production standpoint uh, you know, that was a 24 track album, man. It's, and it's a big record. There's, there's a big, a lot of dynamics and stuff that we weren't even capable of doing as players back then. And now the technology has gone so far and we have the ability that doesn't mean I want to get away from the rawness and the aggression of it. Trust me, it will be very aggressive and very heavy. Um, it's just, that we have the ability to do something really special and, I want to test the waters with it. And I think that's the one to start with. And then later on, if we find that, Hey, this is really working well and it's a good idea and the people respond to it and they're, cause they're, I know there's a mix, mix of emotions about this and I expect that. And they can, at the end of the day though, it's a huge amount of work. And if it just falls flat and nobody wants it, then I'm not going to do it because I don't want to, I don't want to spin my wheels doing all the work for no return. You know, my time is money. It is, I, I've got a, a, a whole host of things that I can do that pay me, which I need because I need to live. Uh, and I got family and I got people to take care of. So it's like, and it's, it's got to make sense. <clears throat> and we just have to see that at the end of the day, it's really going to be worth it. Um, I mean, you know, the shit that's happening with the whole streaming situation, it's ridiculous. I got this... Uh, this meme the other day and it's got like the Spotify logo and it says, thanks for an amazing year suckers. And the revenue of 2018, 1.37 billion. The average per stream royalty is 0 0.0037 cents. And it says plays needed to earn minimum wage, 1,117,021 plays just to earn minimum wage. So it's, and then at the bottom it says Spotify for Spotify. I mean, it's obviously a big kick in the balls to Spotify, but, the reality is the streaming income is shit. And we've that as we have had a lot of meetings with record companies, the uh, physical market sales keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And now with Best Buy picking out CDs out of the store, they're we're running into a, a problem. That's obviously. I think Chuck, there's a spike in your volume. Well, every time he moves, there it's like oh. yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's it's weird. It's like Skype kind of like spikes his volume for no reason, and then he'll he'll go back to normal again a little bit. There's a spike, and I'm like, what's going on here? Um, but so anyway, physical sales is where the the bands, all of us, make a better royalty. Well, with those crashing, and you get these horrible royalties for streaming. You know, I'm not going to spend a month or six weeks working just in the studio on a particular record and get nothing for it. I'm sorry, but my life is not for charity. I have bills to pay, too. I got to eat, got people to take care of. So that's the that's the reality of it. <clears throat> we just have to see how it goes. And I think that this bullshit will turn around at some point, you know, because they're you know, it's it's a new format. People will companies will develop they will come up with a scheme they will get away with what they can for as long as they can and then uh, legislation will go through the houses of government around the world and rules will be passed and things will become a little more fair and then there'll be another scam that'll come along and or another system that'll come along and soak the artist so it's that's the way it is but i think within the next few years we'll see things get a little fair but at the end of the day this is not charity work. This is a huge amount of work that it takes to make these records. And, you know, people don't understand when I'm say I work 16 hours a day, I do. And anybody that's been in a production with me, they know that. And it's not like I'm just coming in and recording my guitar parts and fucking off. You know, I'm doing my guitar parts and working through every other performance and having input and producing the entire time. So usually it's me and an engineer that are putting in some serious amount of hours. And that's just the recording. You know, the artwork and the layouts and all of the other stuff that goes into it, the discussions, the interviews, the promotion, the all of the shit that you have to do, it's a lot of work behind every single release. And 
it's got to make sense. So I'm willing to test <clears throat> the waters, Storm Rider. We all feel like that's a pretty cool record to start with, and uh, and we'll try it out. Scott, Scott, like, bloody hell. Your As an voice. artist, your audio spiked again. Like it's proper ridiculous. Is it? Is it still spiked? Yep. I don't know what's the matter with Scott today. Four days. <clears throat> Um, as an artist, do you make the same off of a CD as a vinyl, or is there a, a difference for you in the in the price that you that you get as an artist? Uh, that that depends on how your contract is structured, man. It's because they do they play these little games with <clears throat> packaging deductions, so they they'll like automatically take twenty percent off or fifteen or twenty five depends on what's in your deal for given formats. So like a for a, for vinyl, there's nowadays there's there's always a packaging deduction for CDs. There isn't typically for a normal jewel case, but there is for a digipack. Um, there's obviously no packaging deductions for digital sales or for streaming. But if they could get away with it, they would try. <laughs> I can guarantee you that. So there's a lot of things in <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, tiers involved in it, in any given contract that could that can change that. You know, it's not a set in stone thing. It depends on your deal. What was I going to say? Damn it. Um, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, with regards to this whole streaming uh, streaming thing and, like, you know, what you know what artists make and through streaming isn't much and stuff, I, I, I watched this video on YouTube and it tried to explain why, why music is at, is, like, is worth, you know, one track is worth 99 cents on, the, you know, iTunes, for instance. You know, where if you if, say like antiques, for instance, you get a desk, it's like 45 years old or whatever, that that desk might be worth 10 times more than a desk you can go into a local, you know, DIY shop and buy kind of thing. You know how age for certain things kind of they grow in value, for yes. instance. He says, why, why, he says, why isn't this happening with music in not, not like in, in that similar way like you go you go to you go to a museum there's a painting is worth about two million dollars you know why is that worth two million dollars you have music it's been this it's been worth more or less the same thing you know as as a kind of marketing price throughout the whole it's still it's all, you, it's all, it's all still made by artists but the industries are completely different in terms of the value of that art well, that's true, except <clears throat> when you get into a, uh, a specific format, like a first pressing of a, of a record that's very sought after or whatever, you're going you're gonna to pay more for that than you would for a new vinyl. You know, you can pay. I've paid some pretty good money for some of my records, man, you know, like that are first pressing near mint condition of Kiss Alive or whatever. I mean, I've, I've paid some, some money for those records that I have, and that's the kind of thing um, – that it, it's a choice. So, I mean, in, in that way, there is some kind of appreciation uh, monetarily in some of these old antiques and, and type things with music. But, you know, I mean, hey, if, if somebody pays 99 cents for an Apple download, at least they're paying for it. You know, they're not paying for it. They're not paying for it with YouTube. They're not paying for it. You know, if you can pay 10 or $15 a month and have access to to a library of everything that's ever been recorded by man how the fuck is the accounting really working you know that's my point it's there's a lot of gray area in that in that whole situation right now and it's it's not cool we can see it you know I, i've had meetings with some important people at record companies and everybody's very concerned and i'm like well you guys need to figure it out you know don't we're we write the songs we make the records you have to figure out how to save your own asses don't look to me for how to save you how to bail you out you know i mean at, at the end of the day we we are in this together to a degree uh but you know the the labels they've allowed this kind of stuff to happen you know from the stamp even from the day of of the whole this, when CDs came out and then all of a sudden it came, became so easy and accessible to get CD burners, you know, bootlegs have always been a thing. 
The difference was back when bootlegs were happening, whether it was a record that was pressed or just cassette bootlegs, is that the quality was usually shit. But as soon as you could go digital, 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 100%, you know, perfect audio quality, now you've got a problem. If somebody's taking burned CDs, and I remember back early, early in the band's career, they would be selling those on the on the playground or at school for like 10 Deutschmarks for a burned CD. So, you know, that was already a problem because they're getting full fidelity quality for a cheap price. If they don't care about the artwork and the packaging, then, then they just want the songs, then they got it. <clears throat> but this whole, where it developed and what it turned into is, uh, it's very concerning for the old model. And I don't see it being good for any, really any good for a new model. Um, but, Physical sales are going down by 20 to 25 percent every year, which is bad. You know, at the at the end of the day, it's bad. So we just have to see where all this leads. I, I mean, I do believe that there's going to come a time where CDs will be a thing of the past. And maybe there's going to be special editions where a record company makes 2000 CDs globally or something like that. But if things continue on this trend, then physical product is going to be harder and harder to get. I actually could see a day where. You have a very limited amount of CDs pressed on a new album cycle. You have vinyl and you have streaming, and those are your options. And Because I don't think vinyl is ever going to go away. I don't know how much of this is a trend and we're like at the top of a bubble right now that's ready to pop. Or maybe the bubble has the ability to get much bigger. I'm not sure about that because I, I see that there are young people that are getting in, interested in vinyl and all that stuff, and that's cool, but I don't know if it's just a passing phase. You know, In a year or two, we'll know if if high school kids are still think that records are cool, if it's just a trendy thing right now, um, or people in general, not just high school kids, but just people in general, but vinyl will never go away. It never, every iced earth album we've ever recorded has been on vinyl. Even at the absolute bottom of the barrel interest, there were still, you know, for a label, they'd be like, Oh, we can still sell a thousand or 2000 copies. No problem. You know, cause there's enough collectors out there that would want that, but you know, selling 10, 15,000 copies on an album cycle, you know, that 15 years ago would have been unheard of. Like everybody'd be like, what? No, no way. Nobody's going to buy that much vinyl. But now, now they're doing it. So, yeah, vinyl for me is, is, it's the best way to listen to, to a record, to music. You know, I, I, yeah, do I use Spotify? Yes, but I only use Spotify when I'm out and about, like through my phone, right? So you can't necessarily carry your vinyl player outside. Um, <laughs> but when it comes to like home listening, like vinyl is, is is my go-to uh, format um speaking of vinyl i i thought I about this story about this band i forget what they're called um but uh they they're doing something to kind of spark to spark sales in their product and it's quite an interesting thing i, I don't know whether it would be adopted at all by anyone else but i just find it very interesting what what they're doing they're they're doing a thing where their music is made to order. So they say they've got a, you know say they've got an eight track album for instance, right? And they get two hundred people that want to buy that on vinyl. Each vinyl they record that album live for every vinyl. So every vinyl is a unique take of that record, and then they basically so everyone's getting the same songs to a point, but. You know, you might have a little mess up here and a little note, wrong note there, or the the performance may be slightly different on each pressing. And I find that incredibly interesting in in a in a, in a business model for a band. I think that's fascinating. It, it is interesting, but like how to make money on that? You would have to sell those for pretty serious money if you're yes. talking cutting an actual record for that performance. So you're talking about an acetate. You're talking about having the equipment to do it, and the engineer knows how to do it. Um, it's a good idea, but I think it's like financially not a, not a possibility. I, I think it'll, it may be a cool little gimmick to talk about once, but for it to turn into an actual model, I mean, you gotta, you gotta think, man, you have, if everybody lived in the same house and had all of their, their recording gear set up, something like that's a little more realistic, but yeah. you're, when you live in other homes, even or you're in uh, in other states or countries like Iced Earth is getting together for anything is like six thousand dollars like that just to get together and say hi guys how you doing or more <laughs> because of the because of the flights it's international flights too sure. and everybody coming together so we don't you know we have to think about that realistically you get 
you know, everybody together. And then we're going to hang out and record the same songs four times a day and sell four records in a day. How much are we going to have to sell those for to warrant our time that it takes to go through and do that? A lot, <laughs> I can tell you. And then you have to mix the record as well. You know, I mean, so it's not, it's a nice idea, completely unrealistic economically, very. You, if somebody's yeah. willing to pay, you know, a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars for every record, and we could knock out ten of those a day, you know, we would be able to get take care of our costs and and probably make a little bit of money too. But it's sounds a little bit unrealistic. Speaking of uh, speaking of projects that um that I'm that I a passion project that me and Chuck are <clears throat> being talks with in talks about, and it's going to be very difficult for us to really even begin it. Really, um, is we re we really want to do an ice surf documentary, like a fan made ice surf documentary. Mm -hmm. But I want to do it the proper way. I want to get you know your your kind of blessing. You know, whoever owns the music, the Century Media owns all the back catalog. Get their blessing. You know, get their copyright permission, and, and go full board with it. Uh, but like. Because it's going to be non for, the way I would see it, it'd be non for profit. But if I'm getting everyone involved, it'd probably be for profit. But ignoring that, fan made, if I did it my way, it'd be fan made. It would be just like a fan thing. But like, mm -hmm. my friend was like, you do realize, you know, you need to get all the gear, you need to get people to like, you know, do lighting, cameramen, flights to the States, you know, get permission from everyone to interview them, travel, you know, food, you know, paying your, the staff that you're going to be. I'm like, yeah, that's that's gonna be difficult. <laughs> hey man, it's it, it's you know, an admirable goal, and you know it would be cool. But you are you're talking about costs. Even if you do it on the cheap, there's money involved, and it's not a little bit. And you know <clears throat> maybe you could do a GoFundMe kind of thing or some shit and try to raise money for that. But you know if you're talking about wanting it, you know if you put it you put it up on youtube even you're gonna have to get sony's permission to yeah. run the music you know i mean i can say yeah it's fine with me yeah, yeah but yeah. they would probably not even give you any problems but you never know you have to get a permission and you got to have attorneys involved because there's going to be contracts and it's like there's a, a lot of a lot of costs besides all the stuff that you just mentioned i guarantee if you really sit down and put pen to paper you're going to come up with a lot more and that's the that's the thing but if you do uh if you do it and we're just to put it out on YouTube is really a, uh, a for the fans kind of thing. That's yeah, yeah. you want to spend your time for that. That's cool. But if you want to make a DVD type of deal and try to sell it, first of all, who's going to buy it? <laughs> you know, DVD sales are, <laughs> are also down yeah. the shit right now. I mean, physical stuff in general is down. So you then have to, you know, strike up a deal with Amazon and maybe Netflix or whatever to try to get people that have these streaming services do it, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it could be cool. I, I would, depending on how you guys set it up, I mean, I'd have to have a lot more details before I could get behind it, but you, right. it needs to be, if you, you know, I'm always of the feeling that I want to do things the right way or not yeah. do it at Exactly. And, that's that's my mindset on it. If you know, if, so, if it's not going to look good, if it's not going to sound good, if it's just going to be a cobbled together, because I can I can make a pretty simple documentary of my voiceover with clips from uh, interviews with numerous members already. Just cut clips of them talking about specific moments that I'm actually covering, like the early poetry days. Can have Gene on talking about it, where we was had him on, etc. etc. I can string together a documentary that is just probably cost very little money throw it together mm. with the assets I already have on my PC and be done with it. But I won't feel that it's good enough. Yeah. You, especially for, you know, I surf is my favorite band of all time. They've been, you know, your music's been in my life since I was a teenager and it means the world to me. I, I don't want to do a half assed job of telling that story. You know, mm. that's the thing, you know, it's either got to be top dollar quality or not nothing at all. That's my yeah. personal opinion. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't know, dude. Just <laughs> we'll see. Maybe yeah, I'm, just maybe I'm in over my head a little bit. Like, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the desire is for something like that. Uh, it's a very cool story. There's no doubt. There's not much like it. But you know, with the band being, um, I would say, you know, we're not we're we're beyond a cult band, you know, but we're not mainstream, and we're not a band that's going to be. Um, 
I was just having this discussion recently. You know, I, I just don't care enough about monetary gain to sacrifice my artistic integrity. Yeah. It's not an, I, I it's agree. Never an option. It never will be an option. And I think anybody that they would, you know, if you talk to Bill or Gene or Greg or any of the guys from the old, old days, it was exactly the same and it's never going to change. So that's not, it's not going to happen. And I'm, I'm fine with that. I think we've had, we've, we've reached a really great level of status as a band that has been completely true always. And that's the, that's the thing that matters. And that's actually what gives us the loyalty from the fan base. Um, but my unwavering attitude towards that has probably also cost us opportunities to advance the band further from uh, popularity or which always leads to monetary gain. Um, but it's just my, Artistic integrity is not for sale, and I will not be pressured by label types to write songs a certain way to fit some kind of a mold for a trend within the genre of heavy metal. That's never going to happen. I mean, it's and there and I've gotten into discussions many years ago with with people in the business about that, and probably pissing people off. But that's the way it is, you know. So I don't really care. I mean, I'm not here to make friends with everybody on the planet. I'm here to because I have shit to do and I have something to say. And you can either get into it or not. I don't really give a fuck. If you do, cool. <laughs> if you don't, that's fine too. I don't care. There's plenty of shit to listen to and to get into out there. Well, you got now, ass, you one, got ass support, so that's all good. <laughs> now, one question me and Jason often ponder, and we, we've tried to find it and we can't find it. Um, we're curious as to what the best-selling Ice Earth record is. Do you know what that is? I've heard rumors that it's Glorious Burden. Um, but definitely in the... St- States, it would have been the glorious burden that's for sure um that's that is that it's always by territory man so you have to okay you know, if if you look at a uh and the global globally glorious burden probably was as well that's possible because it was really coming up to a peak then um i would have to look i'd have to add have to okay. just add discuss i have to go through statements and um i haven't really thought about that probably have to talk to uh, uh, Philip at Century Media, my product manager. He, he could probably find that info out for me pretty quick. By the way, speaking of Glorious Burden, the, 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 the vinyl of that is probably the best vinyl I've ever heard in terms of just sonically sound production. It sounds fucking incredible. Like, it's, it's the vinyl that I measure every other vinyl press to because it just sounds so full, powerful, Awesome. The only downside is not many fans can get it now because it's going for silly prices on the used market. Yeah, it's well. I mean, dude, that's a uh, that was in these lean years for vinyl too. You got to remember there yeah. there probably was only a thousand of those made or something. I I don't know for sure, but very limited because that vinyl wasn't selling then. It wasn't a hot thing. So, uh, I mean, it was selling to collectors, but but that's right. it. <clears throat> um, do you see SPV doing uh, a reissues like Century Media did of uh, their and the, the Demons also is going for like silly money? Do you ever see the Demons vinyls getting reissued or you know glorious and crucible? Demons, well, the Century Media actually has the uh, they have the rights to this SPV catalog, so that's something that's going to roll out in the course of another. I don't know when, maybe a year, maybe two. I'm not sure. It's it's on the agenda. There's a lot of stuff happening. Um, Demons and Wizards, uh, Hansi and I own those masters free and clear, and we are negotiating now not only our new deal, but a deal to re-release the back catalog. So uh, that is happening. Um, it's It will be remastered. They're on the sec- we don't have, we're having a really hard time finding bonus content for the first album. Um, but we have a lot of bonus content for the second album or um, demos and stuff like that. So there will be some cool shit. And the artwork is getting a complete revamp on the second record. The first album um, has uh, has Danny Mickey's original inks and Roy has recolored it and given it a facelift. So it looks amazing. The, uh, the second record is a completely new drawing. Based on similar concepts, but I was never happy with that one. So I, I was 
you know, I talked to Hansi and said, man, I really want to read, I want our guys, my guys, you know, to redo that and to, to bring it, bring it to, to life again, make it better, make, take it a step further. So we've done that. Um, the new cover looks badass. It looks fucking awesome. And the actually That's- most of the interior panels are done now. And, um, there's a lot of excitement for those albums to come out because the first album was never available on black vinyl. It was only a picture disc. So that's going to sell huge because that was a very big record. It was a the demons and wizards first album. You know, we got a Grammy nomination for that album and it was a very, very successful thing. And that clearly nobody's forgotten after all these years, which is we're, we're like so blessed actually. Um, so there's going to be, new mastering of those albums that we have to remaster to make new vinyl anyway. Um, and that's going to happen. What happens, uh, next in line, I'll go ahead and tell you here, you guys get it first there. On, and this is what's really cool is on the exact 30th day or 30th year to the day. And on April 12th, enter the realm will come out on vinyl for the first time. So that's coming april 12th and and the artwork is absolutely might be the best album cover we've ever had i'm just like blown away by the intensity of it. it's based on the original concept that i had back in the day but with brian rathard who was yep brian rathard who was the uh the artist was you know you he was using colored pencils and it was a completely different medium now so dave dave and i got together several months ago and had a consult consulting about this and we went through and and uh and he has him and roy have done it might be the coolest album cover we've ever had <laughs> it's really badass and so that's going to be coming on april 12th and we're in the process of doing that so that'll be the seven the, or the second release on uh ravencraft productions and then next year is the 20th anniversary of alive in athens so we we are also going to be doing a uh re-release for the first time ever to have Alive in Athens on black vinyl. Or, I mean, I'm sure they're going to do colors too, but instead of just fucking picture discs, because the picture disc box set was cool to look at. Sounds like ass, you know? I've, and that, I've, I'm not a, uh, Sorry, I've, I've never played mine. <laughs> I've never played yeah. mine solely because it's picture disc. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, they, they sound okay for a few plays, but then they start to get pretty shitty. It's not worth doing, you know? I, I don't... I want to have a proper vinyl release of that record. So uh, that's something that Philip and I have been talking about. And there's going to be a lot of things like with a catalog this big, there's so much that they want to do and that we can do. Um, so those are immediate things. And when would we fit the SPV catalog in there? I don't know yet. You know, I really don't know where it's a, it's a lot of work. And Philip's like, man, he actually wrote me in an email the other day what is your poor product manager supposed manager supposed to do? You've been so productive through all the years and there are so many great things. How are we going to handle this? <laughs> I don't know, but figure it out, man. But, uh, so anyway, that's, that's, there, that's next year. There's going to be two significant ice earth releases. And, um, I don't think we should cloud it up by trying to get the SPV catalog out that quick. I, I mean, it's there. I know it might be a good idea to get it up back up on the streaming services because once the rights reverted to Century Media, they're still figuring that out. But I, I mean, I don't. A lot of people complain that those records aren't there. All I can say is, right now it's in transition. It will be taken care of at some point, nice. but at the moment, it's not happening immediately. It's it's a it's a thing that's going to happen down the road. We've just got to get it on the on the schedule because there's so many things and. Enter the realm is a big deal. You know, that's a, and, and it's really cool that purgatory happens now and enter the realm in April. You know, those two things really are very connected. And believe me, none of this was part of the plan. It all just happened. That's why I'm saying like the, the universe has a way of working that I can't, none of us really understand. But for me to be going through archives, I find a box of old purgatory stuff and within a couple of days, I see that you guys have interviewed Gene and I get together within two weeks from opening that box ish, two weeks ish. I'm like fucking having dinner with Gene. And within a few months, we're recording together. It's like, this is crazy. And then I have this purgatory thing coming out. And then in April, the, the inner the realm thing has been talked about for quite a while, actually. But we didn't even realize just until 
I don't know, maybe three or four weeks ago, Philip and I were on the phone and he said, John, do you realize that on April 12th, on Friday, which is they all the releases come on Fridays now, he said that is 30 years to the day that you put out the Enter the Realm demo tape. And I was like, are you serious, man? And he said, no, nah, man, it's it. And so I said, well, then we have our release date, you know. So the, right. this, this artwork, the artwork for Enter the Realm has been done since uh, February. <laughs> We've been planning this for quite a while. And a day, I got Dave working on it towards the end of uh, 2017. He was already working on it. And he came to me when we played in Indianapolis. He brought his iPad, showing me, he's showing me the sketch. And uh, so it's, it's pretty badass, dude. It's going to be remastered. Actually, I just approved the mastering for it uh, yesterday. And the vinyl master, it's going to sound fucking great. You know, for what it is, for, the, for, for it being that right. period. To have a proper vinyl of it is going to be nice. They're going to do CDs too, but you know I'm more interested in the records. So now, have you ever thought of uh, just putting out a cassette just for like for? Is there going to be a cassette for Enter the Realm? Talking about it right now, it hasn't been okay. Confused. That was even. That would I'm be just so trying cool to the nostalgia for all the people that don't have the original. Yeah, I'm just I'm trying to you know I don't know if they want to mess with that or not. And if they don't, then I figure we'll do a couple hundred ourselves and sell them through the merch store. So it's being talked about right now. If they're okay, with that. I'm just like losing my mind a little bit because I'm not the biggest cassette collector like going. Like. But anyway, well, um, <laughs> I was will say. Athens be the full five black finals, or can you guys put that in? It'll be five. Got to be. If we, okay. I mean, we can't. I don't think we can squeeze it down to four without losing audio quality. Uh, I don't know though. You know, we, we really have to analyze that. That's something that the, that Philip and actually the plant, they're going to have to give me their advice on. I was nervous about putting all of the purgatory songs on one side because, you know, back in the day, it was always any more than 22 si minutes aside, you start losing uh, audio fidelity, but the manufacturing plant that we have is, which is top notch. Um, over in uh, in eastern, well, former eastern Germany, um, they they said that for heavy metal music, it's not an issue if you're if you're talking about very complicated jazz or classical. Uh, to put that many minutes on one side is going to be more noticeable, but it sounds great. I mean, I got it yesterday or the day before yesterday, and it I'm very impressed with the way it sounds. And they guaranteed me. They he, Philip said the plant absolutely will not manufacture it if they think you're going to be losing fidelity but with such a few amount of songs you know it made it makes it easier so you don't have to flip your record after two songs right. or three songs you know so it's it is for in that way it's a little bit cooler to have them all on one side and have the etching on the other but it does sound fine so maybe uh given that that they may be able to squeeze it down to a four album set my concern about this has always been that it's going to be expensive because you can't have something like a five album set and have it not be pricey it's going to be right. but it's a legendary album and it needs to be on vinyl proper vinyl for for once and the 20th anniversary makes sense to do that so couldn't couldn't agree more man like it's 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 in the metal community just not not the ice earth community like the general metal community is, is held as one of the greatest live albums ever 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 recorded and i it's my favorite I'm, I'm a bit biased, I suppose, but it's my favorite live album <laughs> ever. So, it's I like it too, man. I mean, I don't I don't ever listen to it, but I do. I'm proud of it, and it's a it was a certainly an awesome period of the in the band's history. I mean, the Greeks are amazing, fucking crazy, crazy fans still to this day. I love playing there more than anywhere. <laughs> and the just to touch on the Purgatory, I know I think you said you have it right there. The etching on that. Purgatory vinyl is amazing. Uh, yeah, David, tried to, we tried to do the haunted house, uh, but it didn't. It, it wasn't going to work. The plant said this is going to be a problem, so they just ended up putting the the logo with the flames on it, um, which is crazy. Was telling me how long it took him to uh, draw that house. And, yeah, uh, he said it was a tough one to do, but it looks the artwork for that is just outstanding. Yeah, he struggled with that one. I think, you know, it's it's one of those things, man. It's architecture. So it's a much, it's, you know, for a guy who's been doing the kind of stuff that he, I mean, he, Dave is a fantastic, uh, he's a fantastic artist, period. But as a portrait artist for tattoos, which is 
there's not a lot of people that can really do portraits to where you look at the photo, you look at the tattoo and go, I know there's no question who that is. There, you got to be careful who you get to do a portrait on your body because, you know, so I've seen some really bad portraits. Yeah, so me too. <laughs> Dave, Dave does that and he can draw the demonic creatures and all that cool shit. And you know, I think that just having not done a whole lot of architecture, that's what gave him trouble on this. You know, it was just a different thing for him to get into. But yes, it did come out cool. It came out, um, came out very cool. So I think it fits perfectly for, for what we were trying to do. I mean, this is the, uh, the booklet. That's awesome. Wow. And it's got like, a, you know, we wrote some, some liner notes in there. There's stuff from, uh, from me and Gene and Greg and Bill. And uh, it's got the lyrics and there's a picture there of, uh, an old picture where dedicated to Richard where we dedicated because awesome. he died right before this went into manufacturing. Like it was off going off to the plant. So very sad that he, uh, you know, we never got a chance to get together again. You know, it was really, that was a bummer. And, uh, you just never know, man. It's one of those things. And, that, and even last week I was down in South America and my, uh, the, my manager who was the most important, what, the, probably the most important guy in my entire career um, passed away at 49 years old. So uh, it was, it's Sorry. a very, very, yeah, it's very sad. Very, he had to step down in 2007 because he got MS and he's been in a battle for a long time. And even, even we, you know, uh, he managed, in, you know, in flames and Dimmu Borgir and Tiamat and Moonspell and the list goes on and on and on. His, his office was covered with gold and platinum records and he had one of the, most successful management companies uh, for a lot of years. And he, I've known he was the guitarist for Morgoth and I met him in 1990 and we were friends immediately. And then he actually realized that he was a better manager than guitar player. And he started a management company. And um, in 96, he approached me and, and he, towards the end of the dark saga album cycle, he became Ice Earth's manager. We didn't have any management before that. And he, we grew very close through the years and, uh, and even after he got sick, we remained very close. And, and it was, it was really when Carson got sick that, um, I feel like the, some very challenging things happened for iced earth. And, um, it, he was really, he's very important to me, you know? So it's, it's tough. This has been a really, really tough year for friends, you know, whether how much you're in contact or not, it doesn't really matter from sure. world in world Dane dying, um, all the way, you know, uh, with, you know, Ralph Santola and I were not friends, but I still respected the guy and we were on good terms. If I see him out somewhere, I'm going to speak to him. We have no ill will, but we weren't, it just didn't work us being in the band together, but you still, you know, I, I still feel terrible that he, that he passed away. And, um, right. you know, Vinnie Paul was a very good friend of mine and that was horrible. We were over in Europe and I'm like, fuck man. And I missed, I missed Worrell's Memorial and Vinnie's because I was on tour in Europe. And, and I miss Richards because I was out West and it's like, there's always this, this, it's just tough. It's been a really tough year, um, for, uh, for deaths and now Karsten. So I'm, you know, it's one of those things I'm very, very happy that, you know, you guys are re largely responsible for reconnecting me with old friends of mine that actually mean the world to me. And he, and Greg too, man. I mean, Greg and I were the original Beavis and Butthead, dude. We yeah. were those guys. We were fucking complete terrorists and complete assholes and didn't give a fuck what anybody thought. <laughs> and <laughs> he told us. <laughs> and, you know, when he came, when they surprised me at that dinner, I was like, who the fuck is this guy? And he, had, he, he used to do this <laughs> stupid face when we were stoned all the time. And he did that. And I was like, fuck, okay, that's now I know. Because I couldn't. He's gained some weight. He has short hair now. I haven't seen him since like the early nineties or whatever. And I'm just like, okay, I fit first. I'm like, okay, maybe this is a fan. And he's just like walking up to ask for an autograph. So I'm looking at him like, okay, what do you want? And he starts saying something about it. You guys checked out the early bird special. What the fuck? <laughs> and then he makes, he makes this silly, ridiculous face. And I'm like, okay, it's Greg. And I got up and gave him a hug and it was so, but yeah, it's just, you know, it's cool because like whatever, anytime you go through, a split it's hard you know it's hard for me if i had to be the one to say okay this isn't working because my vision's over here and we're not getting there 
you know, and it, that kind of thing happened. I, I had to be the one to make a hard decision several times uh, because I felt like the band and my vision was being held back. But it doesn't mean that I still don't love those guys. You know, I mean, I'm not right. close to I'm not close to everybody that's been in the band. Definitely not. There's some people I don't really care if I ever see them again. And then there are some people that I really did develop a strong bond with that the the breakup, because it is a breakup of a relationship. And that's where it gets. It's not just business because you develop a personal bond when you're in a band together. That's different than if you're just working, if you're a business owner and you have an employee that's fucking up, then you know, it's easy to fire that person because they're just working for you. But when you're doing something like creating art together, you're, and everybody, you, you develop this kind of a bond, but it is what it is. And it's not, it's never easy. It's never been easy for me to do some of the things that I've had to do. Um, I know I could come off as a very hard guy sometimes, and I can be if I need to be, but I also have a really big heart and I'm extremely loyal to the people that I'm loyal to. And so it's, it's been tough, you know, it's been tough to make those kind of decisions, but to be back uh, connected with these guys and to have the relationship that we have now, it's awesome. And, you know, so that's, it's special. And that's what I guess I, I maybe I'm getting a little sentimental because of all the deaths that have happened in the last year alone. You never know, man, you know, and Bill, even though like Bill and I have been in touch several times through the years, it's to do this and to, go back and relive a, a period of our lives that was hugely important and and fun and insane and like all the shit like we did so much dude <laughs> <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be out in a book someday it's for, you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and people be like that can't be true but fucking all of it's true every bit of it and they uh we, we just we were so reckless and lived without fear and wild and fighting and drinking fuck you and just insane behavior did had nothing to lose and it, it was that pure raw energy and attitude that that made it happen you know in those years and it developed and it was moving at a very fast rate and that's the i guess that's the thing that uh when, when we when we were going through it it felt like it was taking an, etern an eternity to get something done but actually things were moving fucking fast you know from the time greg and i split to florida until the time there was a record deal it's not that long actually and the, all of the stuff that went in between to make that a reality was heavy work definitely well, Bill and Gene are super, super nice guys. I know I talk to them both frequently, and they're yeah. just incredible guys. So and, I'm uh, so glad you guys got reconnected. And I, and I tell you, John, man, they, 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 they've both got your back. I tell you that, man, because because when we're, we we kind of posted a little kind of discussion about the re-recordings that are, you know you're going to be hopefully doing, um, and there was a lot of shit talking. You know, oh, John's just doing this, blah blah blah, all this, and and Bill and Gene are like, you don't know John. You know, you know what I mean? Like they, they try to back you up and say, you don't know, John, don't start saying shit, you don't know nothing about it, kind of thing, you know? And I think that's great. Your brotherhood to the end, my friend, you know what I mean? Yeah, there's, dude, there's no doubt about that. And that's the that's the thing that I guess probably bothers, or had bothered all of us through the years, was that it didn't work out. It didn't work out the way everybody wanted it. You know, even me included. I did. There's guys that I did not want to fire that I felt like I had to in order for the band to progress to where it was, where I was chasing the vision in my head. And and it's hard to separate the personal bond between the business bond because at some point that is the band is business. You know, it doesn't artistically, you don't ever want to think of it like that, but it actually is. It's a thing. And the minute that you make a product and you put it out on the market, it's business. Boom. Done. End of story. Sure. And so it's it's one of those deals that it it's, it's becomes complicated. And I'm just really I'm very happy that there's, and, and there's other people in our, you know, Jason Lacey, man, he was an old friend of the band years ago. I mean, years and years ago. And now, and I got to see him in Oklahoma and it's because of you guys, you know, I wouldn't have been in touch with Jason, not because there was any hard feelings at all. I love the guy, but there's, that's the cool thing about what you guys have built with this is reconnected. We've been reconnected. I've gotten back in touch with John Greeley or he got in touch with me and, you know, and, uh, we had we had a really meaningful discussion over the phone, and I've always been a fan of John's voice. I think he's a fucking amazing singer, man. He's awesome. So I, 
Uh, he actually sent me a track the other day that, um, that some Greek guys did. And I was like, John, that's one of the best things I've ever heard your voice. It's the perfect key for his voice. He sounds killer on it. It's probably the best thing <clears throat> I felt. I felt like I was like, wow. And, you know, he sent me one of his CDs with the uh, uh, Seventh Servant thing. So, you know, that, we're in. That EP, what's that? Is, that, that EP is fucking killer. Like, yeah, that's it. I, we, we, me, me and Chuck have both got a copy and we, we, we couldn't promote that more. Like, we were always shouting out, like, <laughs> John Greeley, this EP is awesome. And, yeah. He's you know, a great guitar player as well. Yeah, man. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, it's, it's definitely. Uh, a, a cool thing to be back in touch with some of these guys. And I think, um, from, from this standpoint, you know, especially the purgatory years before, you know, all of that, all the ice earth stuff, it's, that's a, that's the beginning, man. You know what I mean? That's the real beginning. That's it. And that's why it's a cool thing to celebrate that past with this EP. And then, like I said, none of this was planned. It just happened. But now, five months later or whatever, we're going to have enter the realm. And I think that's badass. We've got, you know, this, yeah. this chapter and then this very next chapter, which was the next real thing. And, and that was a, the enter the realm demo was a, uh, it was like, okay, this is it. We got to do something with this. And I was really feeling the pressure. Like, um, I, I don't, cause I didn't know how much, how much more can we do to garner attention and it was getting even more desperate because the death metal shit was taken over. It was like the, in all of these indie labels that would have been interested in a band like iced earth were signing death metal bands from the Tampa area. And I was like, I'm not fucking playing death metal. I'm sorry. That's not going to happen. We're not going to start, you know, just to get a contract like that. Fuck that. I want, I want melody. I want like, you know, shit that means something to me i mean i'm not there's some cool death metal but it's not my thing and that was sort of, that was kind of the pressure back in the day of how can a melodic metal band from tampa florida get a contract so it was coming down from a lot of different areas and i borrowed money from my parents and uh, and that actually the uh i think there was a five thousand dollar total budget and we ended up selling those enter the realm cassettes were 10 bucks which was a lot back then and that was a, it was an expensive demo, but it was expensive to record. Um, it was $2,500 was for the uh, actual recording. And then I think 2,500 went into the manufacturing and promotion and mailings and stuff like that. And, and that was, uh, that was, that was it. And that's why I knew we could recoup by selling 500 copies we could we could recoup enough and i could pay back my parents and i did you know and so that was that was a uh, it was a cool thing but they helped because they knew that it, i mean i didn't i wasn't it was obvious I, I just went to them and said look i need your help we're we've got, I've got a great band together the songs are really coming into it and i've never come to you and asked for any any financial help to go to college i mean i left home as a teenager i didn't even quit finish high school so i'm not doing that but i do need help it's just a loan just give me six months and i'll get it back and they and they did so that was the thing that helped us get that um get that make that demo a reality and it it led to everything that's happened since so you know, it's it's a cool thing to have this much history all come together and at the 30 year mark 30 years you know for this iced earth being 30 years now and next year being 30 of the uh enter the realm demo itself and april 12th man it's pretty fucking cool it, it it's crazy like we we done a video called um is is this an is this an iced earth renaissance because uh the way i see it uh since since Stu joined the band in 2011 uh the band has been on a tear like it's been fucking just just non-stop quality you know throughout you know the, the seven years that you've been going with Stu, and you keep giving us more man like you know we we spoke about all like you know the side bands like we you are know, with a fall and we are sentinels and ashes of Aries and all all these things that all these former members and current members are doing mm. and now you're giving us more stuff to think about like <laughs> the realm being re and i'm just like it's, it's such a great time to be an Ice Earth fan and you know being fans of those of the, of the related music that the members are doing, it's just 
How can we afford all this music? Can you answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, but I, we, I appreciate the fact that you guys will buy it because well, most people probably won't. <laughs> so that's well, that's. Um, I've, yeah. I've pr with the Pogo GP, I've pre-ordered everything. The only things I'm missing is the lilac vinyl and the clear vinyl. Okay. I can't kind of spend my budget a bit <laughs> over budget, and then I couldn't really get the other two when they were announced. But <clears throat> yeah, I'm not between, between me and. Yeah. Between me and Jason, you got ten purgatory cells right there. I know for sure. <laughs> so, right. Oh, oh, and I got and, and I made sure I had to get the signed orange as well while I was at it. So that's cool. You yeah, those my, sold. You got those sold money. out. They sold out in an yeah, hour. Was, yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to say about those uh, the the legacy shirts you're selling, like genius, genius marketing. By the way, you know, yeah. limited. I never got around to buying one. Unfortunately, I missed out. But you know, I digress. Um, I have a question about that. Like, what really went into this, the decision of like what shirt design you're going to start with, and you know what made you choose something wicked and horror show to begin with? Something wicked was because it was the 20th anniversary this year of that record, so that was the reason for the first one. Um, it's not it's not my idea to do the the uh, legacy shirts. That was my manager, Cliff, and I said, no, it's a good idea because we see the requests once in a while. What I don't want to have is I. That where I do a thing where I print up like let's say 200 shirts and 50 of them sell mm -hmm. then I've got my money sitting on a shelf in a warehouse in the fulfillment center so we're just doing the 50 and I know people complain about that but then they just they, they need to make the move quicker the that doesn't mean that there won't ever be another something wicked this way comes shirt but it will be a different it may be a long sleeve or it may be that the back is different or whatever. The album cover will be used again, obviously. It's an Eister album cover. And it's typical when we go out on a, a tour that we do a, a classic shirt design, whatever it might be. It could be Burn Offerings or Storm Rider or whatever. I mean, we've done all of them. We've done on the Plagues of Babylon tour, we took out the Glorious Burden. On You know, we've done it just different ones through the years. We pick one uh, and we do it. And so that's that's the way that we've done that before but i know like on a we know when we're going on tour that we'll do those shirts and there may be like one the tour shirt is always the number one selling shirt because it's got the dates on the back and the people want that for a memory so we know when we do an order and a tour we've got to order those are the designs that we're going to do the most and then we'll put a couple song shirts up and then we typically do a classic shirt. The thing is with this, with the incorruptible cycle, there was so much cool artwork to choose from just on the song shirts that we chose this time to not take a classic design out. So, um, and then basically, so the, the reason something wicked was the first one was because of the 20 year mark horror show was just because we were able to get the line art and Roy recolored it and he made it look really cool. And so we thought, okay, that can be the next one. And what we're going to do next, I don't even know. We've been talking about releasing the brother shirt here in the States for the first time and doing that. That wouldn't be a legacy, but it would be a limited edition shirt. Um, I, feel, I feel confident that we can sell out of 50 shirts very quickly. And I don't want to get stuck with like having 200 shirts, and shirt. 150 sit in the fucking warehouse. And then I'm like, it's my money is being tied up there. My company's money is being tied up in that situation. And then it's, it's not good. You know what I mean? It's not smart business. So we just, we're just doing this and the, you know, whatever shirt design, like, um, uh, I don't know what we're going to do next for a classic when it might be dark saga. Maybe it's going to be dystopia. Maybe it's going to be the first album. I don't know. I mean, we haven't gotten that far. There's so many things already in the pipeline coming and I don't want to hit like, for instance, the end of the realm cover is such a killer cover that there will be a t-shirt for that absolutely because it would be a criminal to not have a t-shirt with that badass artwork on it but that's going to be something that'll be a stock item it's we're not going to do a 50 limited of that because it's that cool so i mean it'll be one that we you know i would feel confident that even you know if i print up 100 of those shirts they're going to sell maybe not in the first week but over the course of a month or two that that'll work but when it comes to old records like old releases to me, we need to keep it limited because you never know what you're going to do. And it, that's why we're, we're just targeting that. But that doesn't mean that, let's say, on the next Iced Earth album cycle tour, uh, we decide to take out the Horror Show t-shirt so that other people have it. 
it won't be the exact t-shirt that was that was put in the legacy series it will be a like that's that actually roy tweaked that um and i was with him in phoenix arizona at his house doing it on the computer we made it so that set's head is much bigger and it's it's not exactly the horror show album cover so when we go back on when we go on tour and we say okay we're going to take horror show out on this run then it'll be maybe it's going to be the actual album cover that way it's going to be set in relation to it maybe it's going to be the one that has the monsters on it you know it's going to have a different back whatever it is we've got tons of artwork related to that album cycle that we will certainly use but in in that particular layout and design that is the 50 that's it you know that's how it works so you know if we do we may do the same design on a gray shirt or on you know that kind of thing then we may do that in the future but it's there'll always be something different that keeps that edition separated and there's a lot of people that collect concert shirts and concert shirts fucking go up in value man so something as limited as a 50 of an iced earth shirt in a few years from now could be worth some significant money because i've seen shirts from from the 80s like from the blizzard of oz tour or diary of a madman or i that just comes to mind because i was at a, a record a vinyl show maybe a year ago and there was a guy there that had classic vintage concert shirts dude they were selling for 250 300 350 dollars for you know a do t-shirt from 1984 you know shit like that stuff that wasn't even printed very well because the prints weren't nearly as cool back then but there's a there's a market for it so i think those you know there's people shouldn't complain about getting something that limited from the iced earth collection you know it's a it's a cool thing to have for a lot of reasons. Now, um, I, I have a question about the, the, the shirts in general, um, because because um, obviously for me, uh, buying from the Ice Earth merch, merch website, it's a bit of a pain because it kills me on shipping. Absolutely murders me on shipping. I don't know what's wrong in the US Postal Service, but they want all the money. <laughs> <laughs> uh so like, there's there's a company called EMP in the UK, yeah, and they have licensed Ice Earth merch, and I saw the same print as the limited something wicked shirt they had on a grey shirt, and I was like, wait a minute, that was limited on IceEarthMerch.com as 50, so why do they have why do they have kind of a variant of it on here? So I messaged them and I I asked them. Is that legit? No, sorry, it wasn't EMP. It was BackstreetMerch.com. I asked them, I was like, is that legit? Because that was only limited to blah, 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 blah on iStuff's merch website. They were like, all of our all of our shirts are licensed. I was like, okay. And I was like, but, yeah, it's, but, was but, it's, like, but it's because it's gray. And then it's not uh, It's not the same. It's not the same. It may be the same print, so but it's they, not. The same. So they, they licensed the print, basically. They, the, 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 the design. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and then it's up to us, you know, me or management to say, well, you can't, you know, you can't use that in the same format that we have that's already been hmm. called yeah. legacy. Series. We could add, we could do a, another run of legacy shirts six months from now and put it on a blue garment if we want. And then we're not, uh, not, uh, not, we're not stomping on it. It's not, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, something I'm confused a bit. That's why something wicked this way comes is an iced earth album cover. It's going to be. Yeah. You. Yeah. What I mean on future merch, it's going to be, it's going to come in and out of circulation as it were, as it has done for the last 20 years. You know, we, it's not the first time that we've done this, but as far as the, the uh, legacy design, when we say there's 50 of those shirts laid out a certain way, that's what it is. It's going to, you know, it's the layout. It may be that on the next something wicked shirt you have, cause that Roy, Roy recolored that. So it's, it's not even like the album cover. So it's yeah, very yeah. Um, I mean, it's the same, same pencils and inks, but Roy colored it and made it fucking awesome. Like so pops, he, right? yeah, it seriously pops. So he just did, did more texturing and a lot more work to it. So that design is going to get used in the future, but it's not going to have the 20th, you know, the sets, the two, uh, onk staffs are together to form the XX like 20 years. There's, there's little things that make that it unique garment and it will be that way. In Europe, that company, I think that's through Plastic Head, is the, the ones that may have been brokering it to Backstreet Merch or whatever. But yeah, yeah. It, 
that the uh, they wanted that design, but I just said, well, you can't you can't have it in black. You can do a, an addition of gray ones if you want, you know, or long sleeve or whatever it is. And anything in the future, that's the way it's going to work. But yeah. we we will protect what comes from the Legacy series to be that way. Whether it ends up being that that's the exclusive colored garment, or that it's just going to be that front print, and then the next time we do it, there's going to be something different on the back. But there will be something that separates it out from the 50 so original it, and, so it and would, the Legacy. It will never be the same the second time. No, yeah. no. but it, but those are our album covers, so of course they're going to be used. I mean, yeah, yeah. thing in the catalog is going to be cycled in and out on merch because that's the way it is, and it always will be. It always will be that way. But if we do a special garment for an anniversary shirt, if it says limited, it's going to be limited. But what does that mean? Does that mean the color that it's on, the front, the back side? Does it mean it's a long sleeve versus a short sleeve? I mean, all of those things are legitimate things because it does change the, the garment. It changes the catalog number. Now it becomes another product because it's on this color, because it's a long sleeve or because it's a hoodie or whatever it is. All of that changes. You know you're giving me all these ideas of what I want there, right? <laughs> um, you know, there's so much badass artwork in the Ice Earth catalog that the the amount of merchandise that we could make is like it's endless. But it, the thing is, the fans don't have; they're not made of money, so it's not. You right. know, we can't just make every we can't make everything that we can dream up because we can dream up everything. You know, but yeah. we got to keep it realistic. I, I still want a set action figure myself. That's my. My fantasy iced earth merchandise. Yeah, it's believe me, that's come up a lot through the years, and it's uh, it's just we have to have about another thousand people that feel that way, and <laughs> to take money out of their wallets and pay for it because I don't want to get stuck with a warehouse full of fucking set figures that nobody bought. <laughs> <laughs> you know. so. Um, I I actually have a really really cool uh, 20th anniversary something wicked shirt from EMP. UK, it's a UK exclusive. It's brown. Yep. Uh, and it's got the 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 uh, track listing on the back, and it's got 20 years. It's got like double mm -hmm. X's like scrawled on there, like scratched in almost. It looks awesome. I love it. It's on my favorite T-shirt. Yeah. My it's favorite album. Good. It's the best album yeah. ever made. I don't care what you say about Number of the Beast. Something we can say comes is the best album ever made, hands down. <laughs> Storm Rider. Hands down. Storm Rider. It's better yeah. than Storm Rider. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a good, but yeah, I, I mean, I approve that design. So every every design that's legit, it comes across my in my eyesight, and I say yay or nay on it. You know, if and so I mean, anything with EMP, all of that stuff that they've done has been approved by me. Uh, they did a pretty cool version of the 30th anniversary shirt where they had a, a sewn in established 1988 on the back. Uh, it's embroidered. And it's got set the three decades strong design, but it's a V-neck shirt. Those are pretty cool. That, they did an ex that thirtieth design mm -hmm. is the best design you've done in your whole history. Because I like the fact that it's so meta. I like the frozen logo. I like set holding an iced earth. It's so meta. It's so like <laughs> this is the best design ever. And I had to it's buy cool. it straight away, and I bought my number one T-shirt straight away. I don't need it in my life. <laughs> yeah, cool man. No, it's a good one. I like it too. It would. It was. Uh, you know, it was it was cool. It was a good one. Okay, I have a question, John. I was listening to Storm Rider just a couple of days ago, and I I heard your vocals on Storm Rider, and I was kind of wondering why just Storm Rider? Like, why hasn't there been more songs? You know, what what made that song special that you sang on it, and not you know something from Dark Saga or something from other records more? I don't know. I mean, I really don't. It's a very personal storm is a pretty personal story. And I think, uh, that might've had something to do with it. It might've even started because, because of back when we were doing it with Gene, he was struggling with the timing so much and I just started doing it. I can't really remember, uh, exactly mm -hmm. what I don't re really remember how that transpired. Um, but it just did. And it kind of stuck. Um, but yeah, it's, and I, I mean, I've done some, some things in lines and, you know, parts, uh, but it, that was not, that's just yelling anyway. It's not singing. <laughs> <laughs> pissed off. And, you know, there's nothing, there's no, any moron can do that shit that I'm doing in Storm Rider. So. I, still, I, still feel, I still think that the best, the best vocal that you've done is the, uh, can't you see this barren land? Later, wait, it's the best, it's the best bit. I love that bit in Ice Surf. It's the, yeah. 
yeah that's my, I guess that's that's my favorite vocal that you've done i think personally i guess it depends on what version you're uh the uh talking. the original although it's weird because i like the the original is really good the map the map version on days of purgatory is okay i don't like the uh, the the kind of falsettos over the top of the main verses. I forget how he does it. It's really cheesy, and I, I didn't like that that much. But to me, the, the definitive track of Ice Earth, Ice Earth is Alive and Athens because you play it like twice as fast, and it's just ferocious, awesome. It's the best. Uh, that's my that's, go-to version. It is, yeah. The, the everything on Alive and Athens is too fucking fast. That's for sure, and that's part of being like not in command of the moment and being. Like the adrenaline's going and you're not owning the situation. The situation's owning you, owning you. And that's, uh, I believe me, there's been a lot of discussions about that kind of thing in the past. And that's the, what separates the men from the boys to be able to have that kind of adrenaline going and still be able to be in the pocket and not playing. Cause it, when you go to a certain point too fast, it just starts to sound fucking nervous. You know, it's mm -hmm. too much, it's too fast. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the thing that bothers me about that record actually is that the tempos are all too fast on everything. So almost everything, but, um, you, if you, enjoy it, that's fine, but it's too, it's not the way the song was written. So it changes the vibe of it. And it sounds like nervous teenagers instead of grown men that should be owning their fucking parts. It, it just <laughs> proves that you've got like, you know, you've got a rhythm hand of steel, John. Like, it's just, yeah. You are the master of the, the you are the, yeah, you're the master of the goat. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. That, that's, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> uh, I, it's I a don't, fact. I, you know, when, when we, uh, when we're, we're getting better at that stuff. Let's put it that way. We're getting better at kind of calming down and being more in the moment, but it's hard. It's hard when you're fucking pumping and you got a raging crowd, you just want to kick them straight in the balls, but you don't have to play. 20 beats a minute faster to do that. <laughs> you just right. have to. But, but please continue to do so because it's awesome. <laughs> so, <laughs> selfish Jason says, please do it because I still has my favorite riff of all time. And live action version when you're playing it really fast sounds fucking killer and you should continue to do it. Thank you very much. Uh, we haven't played that song in a while, actually. So, um, you know, who knows what's going to happen on the next round? It's hard, hard to say. You've been closing with uh, Watching Over Me quite a lot recently. Like yeah, last year. Never got to see you last time. Didn't come to the UK. Yeah, you know. Hey, I don't know what uh, I don't know what to say about that. We should have, but it's always about budgeting, man. You know, and they've got it. The, we just promoters in London and got it or in England have to pay us more for us to come. We can't come there and lose money. It's not an option. So, unfortunately, and and just it's the thing is to the way that the whole doing headline shows in the summertime is never a good idea because of all of the festivals that are going on. But it, we were just really trying to um, maximize the work so that, because when, when you go over to Europe for the summertime, if you're only working on the weekends, all you have is cost for the rest of the week. You've got hotels, salaries, everything, and it just bleeds a tremendous amount of money. So I was hesitant about doing headline shows in the holes of the schedule. Because a lot, also, a lot of people are putting their money into the festivals, so your ticket sales are always lower in the summertime than they are in winter. If Ice Earth headline, headlines a venue in Germany in January versus May, June, July, August, the ticket sales are going to be twice as much in January, for sure. So, but it, it did help us, the bleeding, you know, in terms of just bleeding money from sitting around not being productive and costs are still so that's that's why we did that, and uh, and for whatever reason we weren't able to get an offer from the UK to make it worth us going over there at that time of the year. May have been a different situation for uh, if we would have done it in the winter. So, but we'll get there, man. I mean, we love playing the UK, so it's not it's because, not it's never up it's because I'm there. That's why. That's right. No, it's never it's never up to us. You know, it's never it's like really. I mean, it is. We can ultimately yeah. say no, we're not going to that country, but it if we have to make the decisions based on who's buying the shows and what territory. And, yeah. you know, this could have, this touring cycle for incorruptible could have gone on and on for a while, but I'm demons and wizards is happening. You know, that's yeah. going on. It's been, it's been decades, you know, it needs to happen. And we're like the, the demand is so strong that 
Hansi and I have finally committed our schedules to it and it, it is, it's happening now. So, um, that's the, that's, that's why, it, that's why I kind of cut it a little bit shorter than the, the two previous album cycles, because it's like, we got to get in. Plus to be honest, I needed a break, man. So yeah, we man. guys and I went out to, uh, we went out to Arizona and hiked and hung out together just as friends, no music b- business bullshit. And, had the time of our lives and we stayed there together for a week. And then I stayed for three more weeks by myself and went out camping into the mountains. And dude, there was days where I didn't see any humans and it was fucking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Who, who wants man. to see humans? Who wants to see those things? You know? <laughs> it was, uh, it was incredible. And it was one of the best things I've ever done for myself. And I came back with a huge amount of creative energy and it's just like pff, the floodgates are pouring. So um, it's good. It's very good right now. Um, speaking of, the- is there an estimated release date for Demons? Uh, the target for the new album is uh, January 2020. The uh, that's where I hope we can stay on that. The, because we're we're writing and recording. Well, we're still negotiating record contracts. We are reworking the back catalog, which we want to have out by uh, April. Would be great. May latest. Uh, before the festival start. So those two records will be re-released. And then we are hoping that we will have all of our master tracking done before we have to focus on the live shows and the rehearsals for that. I mean, I still got to learn those old songs, dude. I haven't played that shit since I recorded it. Anything on the second album, because we never did any shows on that record. And I haven't played stuff from the first album since 2000. So it's time to learn some songs. So I got to do, you know write and record a new record, learn the old stuff. We're still negotiating record contracts and the production of the Vakken show, it's going to be pretty badass. We've got some cool plans. So, you know, all of that, I was just over in Germany a few weeks ago, just for meetings. I was there for almost two weeks and it was no real creativity going on. I mean, creativity brainstorming about the plan and how everything's going to roll out. But we met with a lot of people, man, and a lot of key players and, and we're building a crew and the production, the live show, how we're going to handle it. You know, there, there's a lot, there's a lot to this. So, uh, hours and hours and hours of blah, 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 talking, which we have to do. And we have to do that a couple of times a week. Hansi and I are on the phone for hours, certain days, because there is a mountain of details for have, and all of this is happening in a very short amount of time. So we've got our work cut out for us, but it's great. It's absolutely, I have written some of the best instrumental pieces in my entire career in the last few weeks and i'm very very excited to hear what hansi does on top of these things so the uh nice the the feeling is really good really he's very into what i sent him he's going to start doing some recording tomorrow um we had three songs going that we had started working on a few years ago but you know everything got busy for him and for me with iced earth and him with blind guardian and so it's like um now but now once he he's really at the finish line on the orchestral record and come january it's going to be all demons and wizards for both of us for the foreseeable future you know so lots lots of work going on but i'm stoked with the stuff that i've written i mean very very happy because we're going to be taking people on a journey man for sure nice um speaking of uh you sound about the demand is high for this demons project or going yeah going forwards um and you're hitting a lot of festivals like you know you're headlining vodka and you're playing prog power am i correct prog power prog power is a small festival in the states but a good one and that's uh yeah um except i think i've Atlanta. been I, i've i've been pressured by peers of mine to try convince you to try to get onto bloodstock for august next year uh i think like that, that. They, that was in discussion but the offer wasn't strong enough for us so we turned it down I um, mean, it's got to be, that's the thing. It's got to be worth it for us to do it. We're not going to, you know, we're not doing charity. Yeah. It's yeah. not, it's an expensive operation. Uh-huh. That's unfortunate, expensive. man. Yeah, I know it is. We would have loved to have played there, but not for the money they were offering. It's just not, it's not worth our time. So, um, and they realized that, and they, but they were just like, Hey, we don't believe that demons and wizards means anything in the UK. So we can't pay you. And it's like, well, okay, we're headlining Bakken. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and we're headlining <laughs> metal days and we're co-headlining, uh, you know, in Sweden rock and Barcelona rock fest. And we're, we're in big festivals. We're in on main stages, you know, health fest. We've got a great spot. So we're, 
we're in a good position in most of Europe. It just the the UK doesn't. You know, we never. But to be fair, now the the back when those records came out, SPV didn't even have distribution in America at that point on the first album. So there was that was only available as an import import, and I would bet you that it was nearly the same kind of situation for the first album. Now, when the second album came out, um, there was distribution in the States and things were, SPV was taking the UK more seriously because by the time uh, the Glorious Burden came out, there there was some stuff being done in that market. And then we, you know, with Framing Armageddon, we ended up touring with uh, Heaven and Hell there in the UK. And so things were starting to happen to, a little bit for us. Um, but for demons and wizards, it was never, it just hasn't ever been worked. So it, to be fair to bloodstock, if, you know, this band comes from, uh, out of the blue and is expecting to get really good fees and they're like, yeah, but they don't, they don't have a name here. Why would we bring them to our festival? I get that. I I understand that. Um, uh, I have no ill will at all. It's just the reality, (laughs) but for the business is the business. And for us, you know, for Hansi and I, we, we're not going to go to any market in the world and play to where we're, we walk walk away that we have had we spent money to go and play there. That doesn't yeah. make any sense. You know, we we can't lose money on shows. That's not an option. Yeah, a lot, a lot of my peers and friends, because um, what what you usually what you usually kind of see is that Bloodstock almost mirrors Hellfest in their lineup to a point. So my friends and that were like, oh, Demons and Wizards are playing Hellfest. Oh. They're probably going to play Bloodstock because usually they kind of mirror the two festivals mirror lineups quite most more often than not. So oh, probably, and we were like, well, but will they headline? And my friends were like, probably not, you know, which is fair enough. Yeah, but, but we have had to headline, but we still have to make money. You know, we yeah, have to yeah. make a right. couple costs. It's not cheap to do it. And so, and the thing with Hellfest is we're not headlining there. We're in a very good position, hmm. I think like six in the evening on the main stage or whatever, which is good for a festival that size. And, uh, but the difference is that demons and wizards did was successful in France. So there, there was work being done from the first album on. In fact, um, demons and wizards was more, the first album was more successful in France than iced earth or blind guardian back in the day when it happened, because our labels, Hansi was on Virgin at the time and I was with century media and they were, telling us that there was no real metal market in France and uh, you know, that it's just not a territory to be taken that seriously. But then when we signed with SPV and we had this guy, uh, his name's Olivier Garnier, who's been instrumental in, and he's a great, wonderful human. And if I could clone him and drop him into every territory, <laughs> Sturth would be a lot bigger <laughs> world than it is because he does his fucking job. And he did. And he, Loved he loves Iced Earth, he loves Demons and Wizards, he loves Blind Guardian. And when we did that first record, he was the guy who got charged with promoting the album in France and he went for it. And Hansi and I worked our asses off for like four days all day long, in person and in phone interviews. I mean, he had us talking to if any little village newspaper would talk to us, he had an interview. So we were working really hard, and when we went and the album was a big success there. And it actually made Virgin, who was headquartered in Paris, it made them look bad. And it made Century Media look bad that this side project of two of the main dudes from their bands can come together and blow the sales away of right. the main bands. It was like it made them look bad. So they started taking the, the market more seriously after that. Both both sides did. And um, that that's the story with France. So we, we actually have a demons wizards has a history there so there's a compared to okay so um to just uh actually like coming to think about it, just just to like uh double down on the uk thing um i didn't really know about demons and wizards until maybe 2006 so the second that would have been out for about a year and i just remember picking up the album and it had your name on it and i was like well i'm buying this then like you know <laughs> so that just shows that there wasn't really any <clears throat> promotion in the uk but massive marketing in the uk for it because right. i was a huge i still fan at that point uh, obsessively so something like that i, sh- I should have known something about something like that you know having your name on it and all but you know yeah. it just turns out that you know i got into it late and stuff yeah well it, 
again, man, there's there's some territories around the world that have never been really worked properly, even for iced earth, you know, and that's just the way it is. And it's, you know, it is what it is. You know, sometimes you have, uh, not everybody can have the whole, uh, the universe line up like Metallica did to where it's, it, you know, functions just amazing at every level. Cause there's so many levels to making this business work and to making a band successful. And it's more than just, and Metallica worked hard. Those guys worked hard. They earned what they have, believe me. And they, but they have, they also had a really strong, uh, structure around them and a good team around them. And they had, they had some good luck too. They had everything lined up and it just exploded. And they're the, you know, the Beatles of heavy metal or Led Zeppelin of heavy metal or whatever. They're the guys that nobody's ever going to achieve that again, that kind of status. So, um, but that, that's a rare thing, man, that the stars line up like that. That's super rare. And I feel fortunate that the stars have lined up as well as they have for, for me and all the stuff that I'm involved with. So I got, I got no complaints about it. You know, even if some territories, whether it's the UK or Japan or whatever, where we're almost non-existent in some places, it's, it is what it is. We're doing great in others. So, um, right. So I just want your opinion on on something I've you know I've been thinking about with a, with a few people that um like especially in today's kind of climate for music I generally believe that the era is the the time of superstardom bands is dead mm-hmm. like 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 Metallica Maiden these massive multi million dollar bands or whatever it's, I think it's a bit of a dead kind of thing now. Because you've got playlist culture, you've got, you know, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you don't really listen to, people don't really listen to albums anymore in particular. Live, the live scene is good, but it wasn't as good as it used to be. I'm going to, especially here in the UK, I'm going to argue that. Yeah. What's your, what's your, what's your feelings on that? You know, the end, the, I, end, the end of the. I, it, those days are done and they're, they're done for a multitude of reasons. I mean, it was a different time back then uh, for just if nothing else for the shock of it all, you know, you, that's, that's the thing that Metallica did. Let's just use them as an example. They came out and played so fast and so heavy and still had melody. They weren't that. They were still commercial enough, meaning it, it, they, they had appeal enough to a, enough range. It wasn't like a death metal band coming out. Cause then they would have never been able to achieve what they did. They were heavy as shit. They still had melody. And they had an attitude and a message that resonated with the people. But it was a big kick in the balls, even after the same shock effect that took place with Iron Maiden and Judas Priest, which were the breath of fresh air after the Black Sabbath and the Deep Purple era, you know, and Zeppelin and stuff. Then Maiden comes and they're they're playing it faster tempos, big melodies, cool subject matters. You know, there was all this epic quality stuff going on that wasn't just epic in the sense that while we're playing for a really long time and you know like some of those deep purple jams you know i mean i love deep purple but i want to fall asleep sometimes when they go on a 10 minute jam just going through fucking the same old blue scales over and over and over whether it's on a keyboard or on a guitar or whatever i'm like (laughs) you know but (laughs) you know when you look at songs they're awesome but i just am not into that shit that's i call that musician masturbation get to the fucking point that's what i would you know as a listener and songwriter that's kind of what i want to do but to each his own but you know maiden came and it really shook the system up and this the whole you know the the scene and then metallica was able to do that too they were you can hear the influence of iron maiden and sabbath and all of the kick-ass bands but they took it somewhere else that was it appealed to a huge number of people that were feeling more and more angry and more aggressive about things and they could connect with that music and with hetfield's fucking attitude and voice you know not just in playing but in the words that he sang and the way he sang them, is he a Bruce Dickinson or Rob Halford singer? No, he's like the he's like the the working man, the guy that could live next door to you that you can relate to. He's got ripped up jeans and T-shirts and he's like, fuck you. You know, I mean, and, and it works. <laughs> like a, it was something that could appeal to everybody, to all, all of the people that have pent up frustrations. They, you know. It's not about, it's not always about how talented you are. It's like, what energy are you carrying? What message do you have? How well does it resonate to the people? And that's what Metallica did that was extraordinary. And, and the way that it exploded, it was, the timing was absolutely perfect. If they would have come out five years later, I don't think it would have happened. It's just the way things have happened. Now, fast forward to a world where you have 
all this uh, social media and bullshit and the playlist culture, as you're talking about, where, where people don't really listen to music the way that I did when I was younger, the way that you do. It's it's a different thing. And uh, it's very like we got to have satisfaction right now and got to have stimulation right now. And, and their attention spans like a fucking goldfish. You know what I mean? It's like people, you know, they. Oh, yeah, yeah. And squirrel. And they're off in the fucking outer space. <laughs> <laughs> no, like they're not i don't know man it's weird it's what's happening but when you have this constant bombardment of bullshit and and uh and the social media you know there's the whole illusion of rock and roll is being killed by having access to all of your artists all the time so you're you know why should i even want to know what's happening backstage or during the day in the life of a touring heavy metal band i would rather not know i mean because i want to have that the illusion now me being a professional the illusion got smashed 30 years ago <laughs> you know what i mean but the, for the fan that's a big deal now when they have all of this information so accessible there's not it's not as special as it used to be because you know i used to think about when i was a kid what is kiss doing right now man what are they doing and your imagination goes crazy. damn anything like they're, they're doing everyday bullshit mostly that you know but you you want that illusion for a kid believe that there's something else going on it's the same idea of uh when you when you read a book and then a movie comes out most of the time you're disappointed in the movie because your imagination was better than whatever came in the movie and it's the same right the same idea when when you smash the illusion when they're all gone when you've got artists tweeting all the time or putting on facebook or hey i'm on instagram i'm taking a shit right now aren't i special or i'm walking down i'm going to the bakery i'm going to buy some bread i love you all you know whatever the fuck is happening with these artists that do this kind of stuff they don't even know it but they're shitting in their chili completely because they have <laughs> taken away the illusion made rock and roll what it is for decades and now it's gone so you're right the supergroup thing is gone. It can only be created now by corporate money to a an entire culture of sheep. They're the only people that are going to buy into that kind of crap. And it's going to be very short-lived. It's not going to be – you're not going to have bands that, that like Led Zeppelin or Iron Maiden or Ice Earth even that have developed a career and a following over decades and have always been very true to what they've done and that's their thing. That's not going to be – That's the, the entire – scene and culture does not foment that type of artist anymore it's not it's all about give me now give me now and no that's so yesterday you know what i mean but you and that you can see that with some of these bands that are out there that are uh that are trendy at the moment will they have the staying power to be around when you've got a band that's two guys and they're up doing a production but it's all fucking tracks okay maybe they're p playing an instrument but they Two people can't physically be playing what's being played at the show, so they're, it's all half tracks, and maybe they did play the tracks in the studio, fine, but they've got like the circus on stage going on from a production standpoint. So, you know, doing that kind of stuff, but how long will it last? And you're, you're dealing with a a culture those bands that's the music see they have the attention span of this so are those guys going to be relevant in 10 years or 15 or 20 or 30 i doubt it but maybe i'm wrong i don't know and if they are then how much further have we at that point? because th this the way the whole thing is hit, it's not good it, any level, it's not from, I'm talking about from the way music is recorded to what's happening on live performances now to so much of just it's not good man. There's, there's not a whole lot of organic stuff going on it's it's very much the, the social media has destroyed the way it has destroyed the illusion which is the thing that made it special makes that value makes your own imagination of what happening whether it's real or not doesn't matter it's your imagination and you love it you're you're into it it makes you excited and 
that once that's gone, then you've got to constantly be shocking the people or they're going to lose interest. So that, that's the way I see it. I think the days of the superstar band that's going to last for years and years and years is it is over. And I would love to be wrong about that. So I hope I am. But I really think it is I don't even possible. In the post, I don't see how it's possible. We had a lot of responses on this one. So if you want to maybe just call it a rapid fire, because we got a lot, like tons of questions. So Yeah, our, uh, our social media like blew up when we announced that you were going to be on again. And, and we got about 85 questions from people. <laughs> So let's call it rapid fire and, you know, you don't have to go into deep, just, you know, we'll try it that way. That way we don't keep you forever. Because we, we, we always like to include the community like on our Facebook and stuff. Yeah, no problem. Okay. You ready to go, Jason? I'm good to go. Um, Adam Ortiz asks, do you ever consider selling stage props slash stage clothes after tours are wrapped up? Um, yeah, we've, we've, we've done a little bit of that in the past, um, from, and then the money went to charity. I'm trying to remember like the last, the last thing I remember doing that, it's been a long time ago was, uh, demons and wizards related stuff. We had, uh, it was in storage over in Germany for a while. And we had the, this graveyard scene that was sort of built up on, that would go on each side of the drum set <clears throat> and, based on the art from the first album with the kids in the, in the graveyard and uh and those pieces were were sold and the money went to charity and then the actually after that we did it with uh, framing armageddon too we did it with the uh we had these big cutouts of the wolves from the cover and those things were were auctioned and the money was given to a charity over in europe so we've done it but not often it's not uh, it's not really something that's and it's, it's and it's not for profit either. It sounds like you're doing it for a good cause, which is cool. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Jason As Jason Ashcraft asked, uh, "Whatever happened to the BC Rich Igniter seeding alive in Athens?" Uh, I gave that guitar to Michael from Bullbeat as a present yeah. to put over his bar in his home. So it was the only uh, guitar that you know. I mean, I've I've played a uh, a Gibson most of my career the only guitar the only album that ever was recorded with a BC Rich was Alive in Athens and it was that guitar and so since since I'm not a, typically a guy that has a guitar that I've used for all of the records it's always been a brand of guitar which is Gibson even back in the days when I was endorsed by EC by BC Rich I was still recording with Gibsons and in fact when they when I, when they asked me, you know, how do you want us to build your, cause at that point, I think the first guitar I had them build me was a warlock. And I said, I want you to make it like a Les Paul. They weren't happy about that, that I said that <laughs> it's pretty different, pretty different guitar. But the fact is that Gibson's are for my style and my thing. It's what's always worked. You know, it's, it's where yeah. the chunk from and the heavy factor and they can handle the abuse with the kind of picking that I do and, and stay very tight and have a lot of tone. So anyway, that's uh, that guitar was really the only iconic guitar that I had. Uh, Michael told me when his new house, he was building a bar and he was, you know, interested in getting some memorabilia. And I just surprised him. And I gave that to him. And, uh, and that was, uh, I guess four or five years ago. So did you, uh, did you sign it? Um, I didn't, I can't remember if he asked me to or not. I, maybe he did. He might have asked me to. I can't remember. But it was on, I went out on the bus with those and hung out with those guys. It was uh, not too long after my surgery. And I just went out and stayed on the bus and, and traveled with them for four or five days or whatever. And, you know, partied with, uh, hell yeah. It was when they were doing a co-headline tour, tour with, uh, five finger death punch and hell yeah was the support. So, you know, getting to hang with Vinny and the guys and then with, with Michael, of course, was a lot of fun, but I took it on that tour and gave it to him. And so I actually have a video clip of him jamming it at a sound check. It's not his thing. You know, it's too, it's too metal looking for what they are, but he did play it at a sound check and he just sent me a clip on his phone one time several years ago and uh you know it's pretty pretty cool so cool man cool. that's cool yeah. uh john howell i think i pronounced his name right 
Uh, he asks, which songs did you record with your uh, Splawn amp? Uh, none would be the answer. <laughs> um, it's a great amp, but, however, uh, but I, I've never recorded any songs with it. I uh, used it as a, a head, as a backup head on tour at one point. I think there was a point where Troy was using using it as his main sound on some tours, but I have not, uh, I've never used that for any rhythm tracks. I suppose it's possible that I might have used it for some lead guitar stuff that I would have been doing, but even then, I think it probably not because it was typically when I'm recording, um, I don't want to get into too much of, of uh, gear geek stuff, but I don't like to use sounds that are similar to my sound for when I'm doing lead guitar stuff or doing solos, whoever it is I'm recording, whether it's Jake or Troy or anybody. Um, the Larry, my sound is very thick. So it takes a lot to be able to get a single note melody guitar part, or even if I'm stacking it and stacking harmonies and going in and doing a bunch of layering, it's still a big giant wall of heavy metal rhythm guitars that the parts have got to cut through. So I like to try to use a, a different kind of an amplifier um, for the lead guitar parts. And one of my favorites is, through the years has been a Saldano. I don't currently have a Saldano, uh, but Jake does. And that's what we used for, uh, for his parts. And he stores it here at Independence Hall because we used it also on the U.S. run for his live rig. And I, I had a Saldano and it got trashed in the flood and I never bought another one. But I've got tons of amplifiers and all different ones. And, you know, we can always find a sound that's going to be able to cut through the wall of Larry, of my signature sound. And, and be able to get good and, and melodic. So uh, an amp, what I'm getting to is the amp like the Splawn is a hot-rotted Marshall, which goes more towards the, the world of the Larry amp. And it's not really uh, something that I would typically use to, to do lead guitar parts. But if I did do any recording with that, it would have been for a lead guitar part. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's not quite as, as sharp and cutting as the Saldano is. It's more smooth and more dialed in, scooped sort of a sound. So I like the sound of the amp. I do. And I've used it just for jamming and for rehearsing. But it's not its not something I've done in any recording that I can remember. And if I would have, I know it would have just been for a lead guitar part. Coolio. Uh, this next guy, I'm, I'm going to butcher his surname. Dan Vinci Gura. I'm sorry, dude, but I can't pronounce <laughs> names. Uh, he... he it's weird. Um, I don't know whether he's mistaken here, but he says, Isturf pretty much does headlining shows for every tour. Why does John think Isturf un are unable to get on an opening slot for a big name band like Metallica or Iron Maiden? Should Isturf's manager work harder? Um, I mean, the, there's a lot of... It's not that I don't think we should. We should. That would be great. Um, the biggest band that we've ever supported on a tour, well, there's two, was Bulby and was... Uh, uh, heaven and hell back in 2007 you know we were doing arenas opening for them and it, it's it is a lot of it's about connections and being on the same booking agency having the same booking agency or you know managers that owe each other favors and that kind of stuff kind of that kind of thing so yes our management should always be working harder always but um that doesn't even guarantee that you're going to get on you know to to a tour like that. I mean, when I was, when Rod, Rod Smallwood was wanting to sign Iced Earth for their, for Sanctuary Records back around the, I guess it was after Horror Show. And I said, you know, first of all, you're, the, what's, what, why would, why should we? I mean, there's a lot of other record companies that want to sign a band. So why should we sign with you guys? And, you know, Rod gave me the spiel. And then I said, well, what about touring with Maiden? Does that, is there, are we going to get a guaranteed tour with Maiden? And he said, well, John, it's a lot more likely to happen if, if you're with us. And I was like, okay, cool. That's good to know. But I mean, at the end of the day, the, the deal wasn't as good. So I'm not going to sign a bad contract just for the hopes of being able to, able to open for Iron Maiden. And besides that, um, opening for Iron Maiden is not an easy thing. Iron Maiden is fucking Iron Maiden, man. And, you know, you're just because you you love the band and you want to go out and think that's a great idea, it doesn't mean that you're going to be um, well-received by everybody because Maiden fans are rabid and they're there to see Iron Maiden, and it's that way for Kiss as well uh, in the old days. I mean, and Ozzy even back in the old, old days, man, on the first few Ozzy records, he was taking out big bands, took Metallica out. 
as support. Big shot in the arm for those guys' career. But I've seen bands. I saw Queensryche open for Kiss, and they got booed off stage. I mean, they they didn't go off stage, but I felt terrible for them. It was on the Warning Tour, very first album. And here they are playing arenas, opening for Kiss. And Kiss fans are just like, fuck this. We want Kiss. Boo, boo. And the guys continued on. And I was a Queensryche fan since the EP. So I'm like, fuck off, you know, yelling at them. But I just know that there's uh, sometimes it could cannot always go amazingly well. When we opened for Volbeat, that was, you know, and, and they were doing, you know, the first 20 shows were big sold out clubs, three and a half to 5,000. Then we went into sold out arenas and did 20 of those shows. And it was 15 to 20,000 people every night. Dude, we played in, in Sweden and we would get done playing and you could hear a pin drop and people were just looking at us. They didn't boo at us, but they were just looking at us. So fucking weird. And you're in an arena, man. And we're looking at each other like, holy shit, this is fucking weird. <laughs> a pin drop. So it was clearly another audience man you know and then it but then afterwards you meet people backstage and they go that was one of the best shows i've ever seen and then they walk away and you're like <laughs> so some of it's cultural too but they they were obviously they were going crazy for volby but they're more pop and you know there's a lot more rock and roll and some metal and it's just all these mixtures of music so it was and we go on stage and we've got big fucking drops with zombies and shit and we're all ah you know metal and i think some of the teenage girls in the audience just did not know how to handle that but um we would be we would be happy to open for maiden or kiss or ozzy or any of these bands um as long as we can make it work within our budget and afford to do the tour uh but getting on those kind of tours it's all about politics it doesn't have anything to do about talent or you know somebody's got to really i mean we would have never got the Volbeat tour if michael wasn't a fan of the band when he was a kid growing up would have never happened so um, I'm just, I'm just going to preface this. I should have done this before I started with the questions. Um, just to the viewers watching and the people that have submitted questions, anything we have covered in the beginning of this interview or in our previous interview a year ago, um, I'm going to be skipping those questions because you know you can check out John's answers from the beginning or the previous interview. So this next question I'm going to be skipping because we've already covered that previously. Uh, we've covered that uh, right uh, Richard Clark asks is the building of independent independence hall finished uh, n not quite it's close the studio is and um, the warehouse is getting more dialed in the office still needs work and the warehouse is uh, is probably 80% there so it's it's getting there but you know with all of the the work that's been going on and taking place it's it, everything's functioning. You know, it's it's in a functioning state, but it's not as dialed in and organized as I would like it. But that just it's going to take time getting cool. there. Though. That's cool. Uh, Julio Gomi, I do apologize if I've pronounced your name wrong. I do that a lot on podcasts and stuff. You'll, you'll Julio. <laughs> anyway, um, they ask. This is a question you've probably gotten a lot, John. Uh, is is there any chance to see a tour with Blind Guardian, Ice Earth, and Demons and Wizards? I think that's well, every fan's dream, right? <laughs> it would be, you know, we're, we're it's definitely there's a chance. Um, it's it has been discussed. That does not mean it will happen. Um, it's one of those things that uh, I would love to do it. I've talked to Hansi about it, and I would love to do it in 2021, just because that would be the 30th anniversary of the first time that we toured together, the bands, and I think that would be a really a cool period to celebrate it and but that there's a lot of moving parts in a decision like that and some of it has to do with where are we given i mean i told hansi that i don't think either band needs to have a new album to do that there's no reason it, just the event itself would sell out everywhere and we have such massive catalogs that we can certainly please the fans by doing any of this stuff so that's not that's not it doesn't I, I was just saying, let's don't make this dependent upon whether our album cycles line up to where we both have new records out. Because for a special event like this, which I think would should be something like minimized to maybe a dozen shows in Europe and you know main markets in America and call it done, you know, and then I think it would be a really kick-ass celebration and, and tickets would definitely sell. So it has been discussed, but 
that doesn't mean it's going to happen. Please know the difference. It's a, there's a lot of things to consist, consider, and they're even as good of friends as we are, there's still politics and budget budgets that have to happen for both of us to be able to put on our show. So it does come down to business at the end of the day. It's fine because uh, me, <laughs> me, me and Chuck, like, we always add to that lit lineup though. We're like, yeah, Blind Guardian, Ice Earth. People will argue which one should headline. I know my answer. Uh, Demons and Wizards. Uh, you know, some people go, oh, you're Witherfall. What about Witherfall? Put that in there. Oh, Ashes of Ares. Put them in there. You know, Seven Seven. Put them in there. So it's like all Ice Earth related things. Throw mm. them into a massive lineup. But it just gets silly. It just gets, you know, selfish. <laughs> it's selfish me. I just make a list of lineup that I want. Anyway. Yeah. I would, uh, I've, I've, I've already thrown Sanctuary's hat in the ring, so that's who I would take. You know, if, if it was up to me, I'd say we want Sanctuary support, and then you know, we'll jo- have- Joseph is amazing. I love Joseph. Yeah, he's a good singer. Definitely. Spoilers, mm-hmm. spoilers. We're 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 very working very hard to get them on the show. So look forward to that, people. I've lost the damn list of questions because my Facebook went weird on me. Do apologize. Coming soon when they get back from Japan is when Weatherfall is going to be visiting the podcast. Man, I want to go to Japan. Japan sounds awesome. You've been to Japan, John, right? I went there for the just for a few days for press on the uh, promo tour of Horror Show. Cool. We never played there. Is there a big language barrier in Japan? I've heard the language barrier is pretty big. Yeah, there is. And it's a different culture, man. And I'm, you know, a very direct person. And I think that's, I've, you know, rubbed elbows the wrong way a little bit over there. And it, it just because one of the reasons I is the uh, goes back to sort of what we were talking about earlier with the there was a point where I was being pressured to to write stuff that was more in the Halloween blind guardian kind of vein German, what I call a German happy metal. And I was like, no. That's not going to happen. You know, take it or leave it. This is Iced Earth. And there, you've got plenty of bands like that. They're all in Germany. You love them. That's cool. But we're Iced Earth and this is what we're going to stay. And I think the way I said it probably came off wrong. And <laughs> and then we, we were supposed to play there on the Glorious Burden Tour. And we had to cancel because that's when Richard went to the Howard Stern show. And he found Bobby Jarzom back for us. And Bobby's fucking incredible drummer. But of course... I'm nervous, like, okay, we're going to switch drummers in the middle of the tour, and I've never played with the guy, so we canceled so that we could set up and rehearse in Los Angeles instead of going to Japan and playing and then not having any time with this new drummer, so that that hurt us also by having to cancel that show. Um, you know, dude, we were doing Gettysburg for the encore, and plus, like, three other songs. It was a pretty heavy tour, and I was just imagining a jamming with a brand new drummer green around the gills and we're playing gettysburg you know a 32 minute piece as an encore like with tracks you know what i mean because we had the whole orchestration and everything on there i'm like we have to rehearse this we can't just go you know at that point ice earth was selling out every place we played in america we were selling out every house of blues that we were at and every every venue and it was just like we had to we had we had to rehearse at least in my mind well of course bobby shows up and fucking nails it i mean just like he had all of his charts written out and stuff and he didn't miss a beat and i'm like fuck we could have played japan so but you know didn't know that at the time and it's one of those things when you're when you've got that you have to make a choice so it's unfortunate uh jeff bud uh asks after seeing the fan love here on podcast in stone and johnny z's brazil under under ice group has has there been any thought given to relaunching the official fan club when, but mem- where members can get access to exclusive sales discounts merch? Uh, you know, dude, we've tried fan clubs through the years and it's it usually, even when they're run by fans, they, they start off with all the good intentions and then they realize how much work it is and how much, uh, time it takes. And, it's, there's not that much money. Even if you do it on a percentage base, say you get 20, 25% of whatever it's you, you're, cons- you're consumed with stuff. And it, there's just, there hasn't, it hasn't been, we've never had a very good experience with it. You know, mm-hmm. uh, the last one that we, that we had, um, I'm trying to think back that would have been around. Crucible era. 
Yeah, and, bef- okay. and for a few years before that, and it was a uh, a company. It was a lady. It was uh, damn drawn a blank. The drummer from uh, Lamb of God. He's a big ice Chris, fan. Cool. Chris Adler, yeah. Chris Adler, yeah. He his wife at the time was had a service like that where she was doing stuff. Um, and it seemed to be okay at first, but then it kind of fell apart and I'm not sure what was going on there, but you know, it was one of those deals where they, it was commission based. So they, they did everything. They did all the communicating, um, of course, running ideas off of us and whatever, but, but it was basically there. It was a, they got paid for it, but I don't know if, however many bands that she was dealing with, if it became too much and it just sort of fell apart. I don't know. I don't really remember. It's been too long ago, but I can, I can tell you that we haven't had much success with those things running smoothly. And I think the thing is when you get to something like the, the kiss army or uh, iron maidens web or their fan club, it's a big business and you can employ a few people and they're making a salary that justifies the amount of time that they have to, to be able to devote to it. And for, for us, it's not really that it's still time consuming. It's the same thing that I face on a daily basis where you're on the verge of breaking through to the big time, but you're not really, but you still have the workload of that entity that's about ready to smash through, but you don't have the manpower because you can't afford it because you haven't reached that next tier financially. So it's, it's, it becomes uh, very time consuming. Like the, I have to spend way more time than most artists do, but I'm also a very hands-on guy. I mean, I'm very crystal clear in my vision and the path that I'm following. You know, a lot of guys aren't, you know, they're more just artistic and come up with some parts and they want to have a uh, relinquished control and not have to think about album covers and layouts and what products and, you know, the merch line and all of the other stuff. But, and you know, for me, when I'm talking about Sons of Liberty, for instance, I had no vision of what an album cover should be like for that. None, not even the logo or anything. It, the music was very clear, but everything else around it, it, I wasn't, didn't feel the need to chase that. Iced Earth is different. It's very different. It's a crystal clear. It's like right there. I can see it. I can reach and grab it and I got to do it that way. So it becomes a lot more time consuming and I have to be more hands on and everything because I feel like if I don't, then we're going to, we're missing something. It's not going to work right. And there are other, other creative things that I'm involved with where it's not the case. So it's not just that I'm, that I'm this obsessive control freak that I have to do everything because it, you know, my partnership with blind guardian with, or I mean with Hansi, it's, it's 50, 50. I mean, when we're doing demons and wizards stuff, he's my partner. I can lean on him. He can lean on me. We go all the way in it together. We discuss everything and that's really cool. So it's not like a, it, it's not that I'm that way with everything I do. It's just that I earth is a very personal thing and it's a very, clear vision that i've been chasing for my entire life almost <laughs> you know so i posted that picture man uh of the uh, the rose patch that i got purgatory patch and ice earth patch and i just said that you know the beginning the vision the metal because that's what it is <laughs> dude i saw it and i i saw the picture and i said to bill do you know who made that because i want i want some <laughs> yeah he yeah. phoned me he yeah. phoned me i was like he's like dude uh, John saw your John saw your rose patch and he wants six of them. I was like, six. <laughs> yeah. Greg yeah, showed the, us that business card and it was pretty cool to see that. And we were telling people, don't call John Schaefer, that's not his number anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. That's he sent me a photo of that. He texted me a photo of that I don't know, within the last couple of weeks, and I was like, Holy shit, dude, you still have that? That's amazing. Because I I don't think I have anything like that. I mean, who knows? You know, there's so much shit and it could be, but most likely something like that would have been trashed in the flood, I bet. So uh, it's really cool that he has it. That's great. Yeah. Um, to get to get that patch done, I basically screen grabbed um, from the interview when, when Greg showed us it. And I brushed, I cut, you know, used like obviously uh, like Photoshop to like kind of clean it up as best I could from, from, from the image. It's probably yeah. not. It's probably not exactly the same, but I did my best to try to capture what it was and brush That's it up. Cool. One of the crazy things was on uh, talking about the rose. We played in Oklahoma, which is where I got to see Jason Lacey for the first time in decades. Um, 
there was a guy that came to the meet and greet. It's the craziest fucking story. He's he's there's there was only five or six of them there, and he he's like so. You're, he said, I, you're not going to remember me, but he said, I have a five inch floppy disc that has your Rose logo on it from school. And he hands me, he said, it's, he hands me three, five inch old school fucking floppy discs. He said, it's on one of these discs for sure. You just have to find a way to read it. I'm like, what, how the hell did you get this? He said, I was trying to be the singer in the Rose. I was jamming with you and Sean O'Dell in the basement of your house. And then my father got transferred to another job. And within a couple of days I had to leave. And he said, I don't think you guys were going to want me in the band anyway, but I was there and he was dropping all this, all the right names. And I'm like, dude, I, cause I don't remember it. Um, I remember a lot of stuff, but there's just some things where I go, fuck, I don't remember that at all. And this guy, he knew Sean O'Dell's mom's name he knew the ch- crazy church that they went to because there was one of these churches where where I actually the reason I got my first passport was to go to the UK to a music festival. Turns out what it really was was Sean's mom taking us to this like Jesus freak festival where they were going to try to brainwash us because she was worried that we were going to burn in hell because we were listening to heavy metal. I'm not even kidding. So that. Wow. So, the, so the, the church that they went, and Greg went to the church one of the times, saw them speaking in tongues and the whole, Wah! and all the shit. He went there <laughs> one. And, and uh, it was pretty crazy that that guy, you know, he, he knew Cal- Calvary Temple, I think was the name of the church. And he knew the church. He knew the names of the parents. He knew the whole thing. So it was, it was a thing. I just, and he had my, somehow, the copy of my logo on a floppy disk, which I still haven't been able to, I put him in a safe when I got home. But I have, because it's like, Maybe it's there. Maybe there's at someday I'll come across a tech to be able to read that file and just see, you know, it's a, but it's a weird that you bring that up because, you know, the rose was an acronym and I won't go into what it stood for, but it was much darker than what the word says. And, um, that was, that was the original intent behind that name. And then for whatever reason, purgatory i just liked the idea and i started noodling around and drawing the logo and i liked it better and i thought it sounded heavier and darker which it does and uh you know we know the rest is history but it's pretty pretty funny i freaked i was a little bit freaked out by that whole exchange with that guy because i'm like holy shit you know sean odell the only other person that's going to remember sean odell is greg you know he was because sean was a guy that i he's the one that introduced me to greg he's the guy that okay, uh, yeah he told us about that I started playing guitar with, with him, with Sean O'Dell. And, uh, you know, we, we were stoners and, you know, getting into shit and whatever, but his, his mom got to him finally because, and the cool thing was, I remember this man, she gave us a, uh, some paperwork from the church that was like, these are the songs that say satanic stuff backwards. So we're like, fuck yeah, we got a guide to go by now. Let's check it out. <laughs> we, um, like It was there intended to scare us. And we're like, no, man, if we play this part of back and black backwards, it's going to say some satanic shit or this verse from the Battle of Evermore, or, you know, Stairway to Heaven or whatever. There was paragraphs of stuff. So we're on my turntable, like doing it. Sure. And it, it even told you what it said. You know, it was like they gave you, here's the song, this is the time, here's where you play it backwards, and this is what it says. We're like, fucking perfect. So we did it. It was awesome. But it did not have the effect she was looking for. But I think she finally broke Sean down, and at some point we drifted apart. And I don't know. I ended up not going to England. I bought a car instead. I ended up buying a Dodge Challenger, 1973 Dodge Challenger for 900 bucks that I, I had been saving this money for since I was a kid. And it was I was going to spend it on a flight ticket and go into the U.K., well, that so, didn't happen. Uh, so, was, so was the car better than going to the UK? Choo- choose your words. Choose your words wisely, man. Hey, dude, <laughs> it, it was much fun. I had a lot of fun with my girlfriend in that car. So, okay, yes. Okay, cool, cool. Mm. It's all good. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Yes, right. <laughs> a lot of all of that. Is, um, is, is that car, is it the car that features in that Colors uh, music video from years ago? No, no. That car, I sold that car before... Uh, I ever took off to Florida. It was a piece of shit. It looked cool. It was an old muscle car and I wish I still had it. 
but it broke down all the time, man. It was, you know, it was just a, it looked badass. It was really, it was a muscle car, but it had a lot of mechanical problems and it was, you know, it wasn't posi traction. So in the snow, it was a motherfucker. I got stuck all the time because it just had the single wheel and it was a 318 Dodge Challenger. It was not a super powerful, but it looked fast, much faster than it was. I drove it like a bat out of hell too. I mean, I beat the shit out of it. And so did the guy that I bought it from, um, who was a guy named Troy, who was, we considered him being in the band. He wasn't in the band. He hadn't gotten an instrument yet, but it was, I think he was going to play bass whenever we got everything together, but it never happened, but I bought his car. So whatever, stupid side issue, side story. But. I remember, I remember my first band and we had this, we needed a bass player and we just like, we were, and one of our friends, he couldn't play bass, he didn't have a bass guitar. We were just like, you're a bassist. We just, we just bought him a bass guitar and made him play bass. Yeah, that's how it was, man. You got some, a buddy that you partied with and had fun with. And, hey, man, you can play this instrument, right? Or not learn, you know, and then just. <laughs> yeah. But how, how much of that ever sticks, you know what I mean? That's the thing. So it's, uh, but the, that was uh, the Rose thing, just to yeah. circle to that. I found in the archives uh, and I don't know if it might've been after I talked to you guys, I found my original Rose t-shirt and I got it framed. Wow. It's, the, it's the one that my, I made the iron on in school. Just like you've probably seen the pictures of me with the purgatory shirt with the homemade shirt on. Cause they're, yeah. they're out there. Gene and Bill have a lot of those photos and I have some too. Um, it was the same class that I was taking that I made the Rose and I found both of those shirts. Now I, I the, the Rose shirt, it was a white shirt and it was cut off halfway and it was, it, but it had the Rose logo on it. My mom ironed it on for me. Um, I had my name like dripping in blood. It said John Schaefer. It was my signature and that was ironed on on the back. And it was folded up into a little Ziploc plastic bag. Dude, for 30 years? I don't know. But I opened that motherfucker and thought I was going to fall out from the stench. It smelled like death. It was unbelievable how bad the odor was from that t-shirt and did i could you, did you smell that bad from back then <laughs> apparently i did i don't know what the fuck what kind of bacteria <laughs> shit was happening in that thing over the course of the last 30 some years it was bad though anyway i let it air out and i took it to a frame shop because i'm like dude i i gotta get this framed and um and just held for posterity if nothing else give it to my daughter you know but i got it I got it framed and I took it in. I said, man, I'm sorry. This thing smells really bad. You might want to get it under glass, you know, soon. Immediately. <laughs> and he said, he was, he said, uh, well, the good thing is I don't have a sense of smell, so it's not going to bother me. I was like, Hey, you're the perfect guy to frame this shirt then. Awesome. So he did it. I got that. And I found, but in the same box, I found the purgatory shirt. So I have that too. That's on the table. Gene sent me a button. Uh, I found a bumper sticker. I'm trying to put together, I want to put a, together a collage to hang it in the office when it's all finished up so i haven't framed that one yet because that one the rose was an idea it was jamming in my friend's living room you know what i mean with a couple guys it's all that's all it ever was but it it was the beginning definitely yeah, it was yeah. starting here and uh so yeah it, it's pretty cool man finding that shit i'm uh, i'm putting together a dedicated ice earth patch jacket and uh i, I said to myself you know when when greg showed us that that business card the rose i'm just like now I'll need that as a patch, damn it. And so I've got a purgatory patch, I've got a rose patch, and I've got everything else is iced earth, so it's going to be a proper article when it's finished. Dude, that's cool, man. You'll have um, you're very I'm, unique. Or, unfortunately, most of the patches are bootlegs because official yeah. iced earth patches are impossible to find. Yeah, they're few and far between, man. You know, it's something was, that we need to do a little more. Kind of there was a uh, there was a Storm Rider one on eBay, official Storm Rider patch, and it sold for about $92. Who pays what? that? For, who pays that for a patch? Like, and, well, and who says it's official? Because I don't think it is. I'd have to see a picture of it. Yeah, but yeah, ninety-two dollars it was sold for. That's insane. Someone got ripped off. I'm telling you. Like, yeah. It's a bit of fabric. <laughs> like, how's that worth? How's that worth like ninety-two dollars? I don't know, man. But what? I, you know, it's we. There's so much stuff like that that we should, we should do more of. But you know, there's it's so there's so much. There's just so much, and there, and I know what's what'll happen is if I invest the money to manufacture a bunch of stuff, people are going to be overwhelmed, and it's not going to sell, and I'm going to end up sitting. It, I mean, some of it will sell, but it'll take a really long time to sell, and I just don't want to have money tied up in something that's sitting around on a shelf, some some warehouse. You know? I think um, 
this is just my opinion. I'm not, I'm not speaking for the fandom or anything like that. Um, I just think from from my point of view, the pace you're going with releasing, you know, the Legacy series and the Christmas box set was really cool. That was quite unexpected. I think the pace that you're releasing, kind of, you know, you know, kind of chunks of merch, I think is pretty a pretty good pace at the moment. I think. Okay. Yeah. I don't. I feel like I'm on the edge of that, whether it's too much or not, and that's the thing. Like, and I think the Christmas box is cool. The challenge coin's really badass. I've seen photos of it. I haven't seen it in person, but they, that came out stellar. I haven't seen the sweater in person yet, but I will next week because Gene and Bill and I are meeting at AKT to sign the albums and uh, and everything that we have to do. And then we're going to go grab some food. But <clears throat> um, that's that being said, I I feel like the the Christmas sweater thing is maybe a little bit too expensive, you know. And we can I, it's an expensive. I would agree. I think. Yeah, it's an ex- it's expensive item to make, um, but I think that there should have been more content. And I think, you know, we learned from it's the first time experimenting with something like this. It's the first time that my guy at AKT's ever done it. It's the first time for my manager, and we were just trying to do something cool. And I think it is cool, but I feel like it's a little bit too pricey, you know. So yeah, I'm, I'm I definitely you'll definitely get the, you you'll, you'll definitely get fans that will just buy it anyway. Like, oh, yeah. I wish I wish I can buy it. I just can't afford it right now, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, go back to the questions. Uh, uh, Steve Mario, I think I've pronounced his name right. Names, man. Why do why do our people have so weird names? I'm gonna I'm gonna shut up. Um, he says, uh, "How could I get a Larry head like John's? I can't seem to be able to order one or or get a price quote." Um, you. You go to LarryAmps.com, I think, or just Google Larry Amps and write to Larry and tell him you want uh, you want the my, you want my signature uh, circuit, and he'll build one. It's not cheap. They're very very expensive amplifiers because they're hand built and it's point to point wiring, and the guy's a master. So you're probably looking at five and a half thousand euros for a for a uh, basic model amp, but it's it's a tank, you know. It's worth it though, yeah. <laughs> It is worth it, and I'm not getting anything from it. But it's just like they're expensive for me to buy. I mean, he doesn't. He's too small. He's a boutique builder, and uh, he doesn't. You know, he, he can't give comp stuff away. It's just that, you know, it's it's my sound, man. We spent a lot of time working on that. Um, he heard the first Ice Earth album on the radio in Germany. He lives in Nuremberg, and he flipped out on my rhythm guitar style. So he went out, bought the album. He tracked me down through more sound. He called the studio and said, can you please get me in touch with this guitar player? I have to build an amp for him. So it's almost like he could feel what I was lacking in my tone. And he had, he had the guy, he was the guy that had the solution. So the next time I was over there was on the night of the storm rider tour. He came and picked me up at the venue. I went to his house and we sat there the entire day and he, and I, you know, I was telling, explaining him, what I wanted and he was hearing it and he was soldering in resistors and working on my circuit right there. We took that head, that head actually that he did that on was his display head. It was what he would take around to show to people. It had so many knobs for the time. It was a very advanced amplifier, but you could get tones from everything from like a Stevie Ray Vaughan tone to ultimately my sound and everything in between. Um, I used that amp for the rest of the tour. Then he picked it up. He sold that amp to Kirk Hammett from Metallica. And he, he, but he had the schematics and he built my head. And then the next time that I used one of those heads was for the burnt offerings recording. So I had my, my Larry amp at that point. The only thing is the tones on that record. If you notice, there's a pretty significant difference between the sound of the guitar on that album versus Dark Saga was I was doing all kinds of experimental miking as well. So I changed too many things at once. You know, there, when you're dealing with mathematics, you need to do your changes incrementally. And what I did was, not only was I recording with a new amplifier, because the first two albums were recorded with a Marshall uh, Jubilee series. So on Burn Offerings, I had a brand new amplifier, plus I was totally experimenting with the way to mic an amplifier. And miking putting the mics out of phase and doing all this stuff to give it to, to searching for the tone in the end, miking it the more simple way, which is what we did on dark saga was the better way. 
and the Dark Saga guitar sound, that's the first album where my guitar sound really came alive. And that's where I was like, okay, I found it after recording three fucking records. So th don't think that it doesn't take a while of trying to figure out how do I get what's happening in my head. It's really complicated because you have a lot of options. And if you move a microphone this much, whether it's away from the speaker cabinet or in the one direction, the sounds that change while the mic is being moved are huge. So you, you have to spend a lot of time on your mic placement. There's so many factors in getting a guitar tone. And that's, it all started to come together on Dark Saga, and now we've got it dialed down to a science. So. That's awesome. That's a cool story, man. It, it must have felt really cool for someone actually wanted to build your amp. That must have felt really cool. Yeah, it did. And you know, I went to and another thing that this guy could look into possibly is the the John Schaefer Signature Series preamp, which is something that I use now more than my main my main heads don't even go on tour anymore. I use a Marshall DSL two thousand as the power amp section, and then the the Larry preamp, my signature preamp, is is what I'm using for the for the tone mostly the power i mean there is it's not exactly like one of my heads because the power section is different it's a marshall power section but it's very close with the preamp and the circuit and i had him create that for me build that for me because i wanted to have my sound even on fly dates in south america asia you know australia new zealand whatever and taking one of the larry heads around was super expensive so he came up with a tube preamp that I can take and plug into the power section of a Marshall, which is common to find pretty much everywhere. So we were able to get very close to my sound um, by doing it that way. And those you can get for, I think they're about two and a half, maybe 3,000 euros. So it's significantly cheaper. And if you already have a Marshall amp or a power section, a, a power amp that you like, you can get pretty close to my tone with the signature preamp. That's an idea. But they're expensive too. They are. Um, I have a question, right? Uh, you can you can tell me to cut this out if you want, but I'm just gonna I'm I'm not afraid to ask anything, so I'm just gonna ask it, okay? Um, I really like the song "The Veil" from Incorruptible. Yep. Fans went mad at one point and they started screaming "Rip Off." There's a song by Loverboy, I forget what it's called, and the the oh. vocal, the, the the vocal melody and the hook and some parts of the lyrics are pretty much identical to that song uh similar is that it's, not identical. Is that... it's, it's absolutely not identical okay. only only somebody that would that's unschooled in music would say that it i, I was I didn't, I didn't mean it. that's not from my point of view it's just but that was brought to my attention in an interview that i did early on the uh incorruptible cycle and then i was like whoa i didn't even think of that but it is it is similar it was completely done it was not done consciously it's not a ripoff it's just that that actually if you were to hear the original version of that it was the song was the working title of that song was called judas and it was a uh similar but slightly different cadence of the vocal and the melody was the same and i had I have it even on the uh, the demos, and the but the, obviously the lyrics were totally different. The song was going in a darker direction, had to do with some betrayal with some people in the music business, and it was not a. Uh, I felt like it was going to hurt the song to to keep going with that tone, because mm -hmm. i I didn't want to I didn't want to give the negativity any power. So I came up with the idea of turning it into a a very sad love story of a uh, this I can't remember what it what it was like a, a woman loses her husband in a car accident and um she's on on her deathbed and his he's there waiting you know that's what the artwork in the booklet is yeah. um it's like that he's he's looking at her through the veil and you know it's a, it's pretty heavy it's pretty dark but it so it turned into that love thing but there when i heard when after the, this guy i did an interview with pointed out that it reminded him of a lover boy song i was like Wow. And then I heard it, of course, it's, yeah. it's, or, but it's not there. If you were to, if somebody was to try to take me to court, they wouldn't win because mm. it's, it's just a cadence and timing thing. The melody is similar, but it, and lyrically, I mean, I'm allowed to use words in the English language. So <laughs> it's, it's not, uh, it, it's not enough that would, it, would ever, that I have no fears of it being a problem. And it certainly was a conscious ripoff. It was probably just an influence that happened. And the yeah, melody, yeah. you know, I mean, none of us, recognize that 
in mm-hmm. in the entire production or somebody would have said something, but none of us actually did. So I don't, I don't have a problem leaving it in here and I don't care. You know what I mean? You know, if somebody wants to say, I, if I have to rip off artists at this point in my career, go fuck yourself. Stay in the basement <laughs> of mom's house and it's just nothing. I, I never needed to rip off people. I've got more creative energy than most people. I've got more in my little pinky than most people do. So I have no, I have no uh, desire yeah. to rip off artists. That, that, and if you did it with Be Lover Boy. <laughs> right. Well, and I mean, I actually like that song. I like, I, there's a couple uh, of their songs from the first record, couple records that I think are pretty cool, even though the band name is extremely gay. And so was their look. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was not my thing, but I thought, eh, you know, I remember when they first turned me loose is a cool song. You know, they had, they had a couple uh, hits here in the States back then. And that's okay. But like, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go out and initially rip off anybody. I mean, or, or intentionally rip off anybody. No way. That's just a, an influence thing that happened and it, but it's similar, but it is not the same, you know, definitely not. That's, it's, uh, that's cool to be cleared up, that to be cleared up. And that's why I said like, you know, if you want to, if you want me to cut this out, that question out, I can cut it out. It's no problem, but uh, I don't full- I have no, I have nothing to hide from about yeah, anything. Yeah. Yeah. About yeah, anything. yeah. You know, not at all. I have no problem with it. It was a bit of a bit of a meltdown with the fandom with about it, but you know. Uh, like fan, fan, fans melt down about all kinds of shit, but it's they <laughs> all have like zero 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 point one percent of the information on any given subject. So they can that's where it comes into the illusion thing. They can base their reaction and attitude on their illusions. How can I control that? Why would I give a fuck? I don't care. You know, they can melt down over things all the time. I, I don't care. Okay, <laughs> that's that's brutal, but cool. Uh, <laughs> it's true. I mean, how can I possibly control what goes on in somebody's yeah, imagination? Yeah, yeah, I, I get it. I yeah, mean, yeah. so why would I worry about it? I mean, I, it's pointless. It doesn't matter. They're they've already made the decision from their comfortable spot in mommy's basement. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know that sounds bad. But like I don't have the time. It, I think about some people that go in and whether it's that they're criticizing Iced Earth or Maiden or Kiss or whatever band they're obsessing over. Do, have, I can't even imagine having enough time in my day to where I can go and rip apart somebody's guitar solo or vocal performance or whatever to a point that these people do. It means they don't have enough going on there in their life. I'm sorry. It's, that's the only thing that it can be. If you if you spend that much time criticizing the art of somebody else, it means that you clearly are frustrated and don't have or don't have the talent to do the art yourself. So why why would any of us give those kind of people any power? And I mean, I know that's different than than having a meltdown in fam, fandom, but there are people that are that are seriously just lost and that they're only they feel like big tough guys when they're you know they're keyboard warriors <laughs> they can talk shit on the internet and it's they're faceless it's like who cares well, i uh, i i i have an opinion of of uh, of, of of what it is to be a fan right um mm-hmm. because i i don't believe like i'm a massive fan of your band right i love i serve to pieces doesn't mean i love everything right is that is that a fair thing sure. so i don't believe that you can i don't so there might be instances where, yeah, you're a fan of a band, you love everything they've done, but I don't, I don't, I think that's very few and far between. I think there's going to be a record or a song that you don't particularly like. But in our Chris Wolf Man re- retrospective, I was quite heavily critical on that. This is quite my opinion, right? Chuck's laughing at me, but yeah, anyway, that's the thing. I, I think be, being a fan, a fan of a band that you love, you can still love them, but you can also be critical as well, like to a point. That's my opinion. Of course you can. I mean, dude, I'm critical of certain Maiden records and Kiss. There's some Kiss records I absolutely hate. I think are biggest pieces of shit on the planet and that are an insult to everything that is Kiss. I still love Kiss. I mean, Jake and I, when we played with him uh, in Spain, Jake and I jumping around, jumping around like fucking teenagers, having to be alive because we're the only real Kiss fans in the band and just going off during the show. And they then, you know, Paul says... And we're going to play something off a of monster or whatever fucking album it was. And Jake and I are like, boo, 
Oh, fuck that. You know? <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that shit. This sucks. Well, you know, we're going on. And next song they play is God of Thunder or fucking whatever. Yeah. We're like, yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't, of course, fans are going to be passionate about any given era, area. I, I don't, Same. and I'm not talking about that. I don't care if songs resonate with people, then yes. that, and, or certain records do, that's great. I don't, I don't really care if everybody gets every album. It it doesn't matter because the every album is honest with my material. And it's a reflection of what's happening with me and with the guys that I'm working with at that particular time. So I don't care if people get it or not, or if they get some albums more than others. I, I don't care. I mean it's I gotta be honest with my art and with my with shit coming out. And for better or for worse, that's the way it is. It just is. You know, if I, and, and like I told you guys before, there things that happen in our personal lives affect what happens on a record mm -hmm. because yeah. it is honest. It's not corporate manufactured. We don't just get up in the morning and get a widget and press a record. It comes from a real place. And those real raw emotions are a direct reflection of things that go on in our personal lives and things that we're experiencing and whatever. So it's all very honest. Sometimes you hit a home run and sometimes, you know, you hit a double. It's just, it's like whatever. We've never, I don't think we've ever struck out with any of our albums. Well, that, and I wouldn't even do a record if I felt like that was the case. The, I'm doing it for me. I don't really, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't write any of this stuff for you or for the other fans. I hope mm -hmm. that you guys like it. That's cool. Yeah. But it's my, it's my personal journey. It's my it's my therapy to make songs and to make records. And if it if it ends up helping people in the process, that's killer. But it's not that's not my goal. When I start yeah, off yeah. writing a record, I'm like, um, is Jason gonna like this? I don't <laughs> care, you know, or any or the hundreds of thousands of other Jasons. It's not if dude, if it was working like that, it wouldn't be honest. So. You know, it's got to be a reflection. And sometimes I'm in tune with myself and my higher self much better than I am at others. And I'm channeling the right stuff. And sometimes mm. there's been times in my career where I'm going through the motions because I have to, because there's a bunch of other stuff going on that's affecting, you know, the, the channeling process. So it's the, it's the same thing with like, you know, for instance, my, this, this podcast we do, right. We'll get comments from people saying like, like when we had Stu on, we had a comment from someone that's saying like, Stu is so well-spoken, can't say much for the, for the uh, for the for the hosts, they need to be more professional. And I'm, I, re I replied saying, I've never said that we were a, pro a professional podcast. What is a professional podcast anyway? I said we're fans. We're gonna ask questions that fans will most likely ask. I don't want to be a robot like the press and go, how was the sh how was the tour? Because we know the tour was great. How was the how was the reception of the last record? We know it was really received really well. So, like mm -hmm. we, we don't want to ask those kind of robotic stock questions because you've probably heard them a million times already in the last year with all the interviews you've been on before right. so we get we get criticized as well like with the podcast i'm just like i don't care but yeah. it's just you don't have to watch it like right that, well that's the that's the thing i mean <clears throat> when people say shit about re-records don't buy them nobody's got a gun to your head like yeah. i don't care you know there's <laughs> there's still break. Nobody, yeah. nobody's, you know, and, I, and it's my shit and i can do what the fuck i want with it and that's the bottom yeah. line you know like whatever I can do. I'm a free man. I can do what the fuck I want, you know. Well, there, 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 there is some funny things about um, women do our retrospects. Like I said, I'm, I, I was critis I'm, I'm critical about Crucible Man. I won't get into details because, you know, um, but like there's, there's a bit of an in joke with that episode actually because I, I don't like Divide the Devour. Chuck does. So everyone keeps making jokes, going like, oh, they're fighting because we never really disagree on a lot of things. But disagreement is healthy because it you know, creates conversation. And we totally disagreed on that song in particular. And we both gave our reasons. Valid yeah. reasons. Like we both kind of like, we didn't like bite each other's heads off over it, which a lot of fandoms do. They, they, go, into, they go to war with each other. I can't give any power to the kind of criticisms because it doesn't matter. You know, it's, yeah, yeah. It, you want, of course, as you want, as an artist, you want people to enjoy your music. Of course. But am I going to get bent out of shape if they don't or if there's certain records that they don't enjoy? No, because I don't really care because it's it starts from, with my own therapy. I'm getting mm -hmm. if it's a song that I'm writing fully, if it, I'm writing music and lyrics and everything, 
then there's a reason that I'm doing that. And, and that reason is very personal. And if you can connect with that, cool. If it's a song that I'm co-writing with somebody else and I'm going to have a different kind of attachment to that track, most likely, depending on what my role is. You know, if I'm, if I want to say something lyrically that's really heavy and really personally, they're really personal, then I'm going to do it. And the rest of the world is going to take that a different way. They're going to, they're going to see it with their eyes and their experiences. And that's cool. Noise again. I can't hear anything. No. Can you hear that? Is it me? Yep, it's you again. It's not, it's not your day, Chuck, man. See, I, I don't hear it, and I'm not moving. I don't know, it's just your your volume just ramps up slowly and just gets overbearing. That and I sounds, don't know why. It almost sounds like an AM radio, Chuck, like a... <laughs> and then it starts get. That's what I'm hearing on my end, anyway. Yeah. Weird. It, it gets really overbearing <laughs> to the point where I've got to take my uh, headphones off sometimes. What if I went without? Possibly. <laughs> just for the last few minutes? I can no, hear you, so it's fine. Uh, okay. we Sorry get about back that, to... guys. It's, it's okay, man. It's, it might not even be. It might be Skype. I don't know. You just don't know. Skype's a piece of shit anyway. Um, right. Should we get back to questions? Is that cool, John? Yeah, man. Sorry about all these Skype being shit. Uh, where am I? Got to do a lot of chopping up with this episode later. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's right. All right. Frankie Loverday. I think that's how you pronounce his surname. L O V E R D E. How would you pronounce that? Loverty. Loverty. All right. Yes. Uh, they ask, um, can we get more of the 30-year anniversary pins? No. No, uh, those. Are done. No, they they just did a, a very limited run of those, so they're they're done. I don't. I mean, the 30-year thing is pretty much over now. At the because we're in the at the end of this year, so I don't. I don't think there's a a reason to, to make more of them. It's fair enough, uh, but it's fair. But there, will be, there will be other enamel pins, you know. Oh yeah, cool. Yeah, we'll make some, we're we're talking about doing some cool set images, and it's just there's so much, dude. And it's like, again, you know, you make stuff. It's good to make that kind of stuff when you know you're going to be out on the road because then you've got you've got a for sure way of getting rid of the stuff, having it. The iceearthmerch.com is a new venture, so we have to build it back. We have, we have to build it up, not back up. We have to build it up and uh, make people aware that they can get stuff. And that's, that's just something that's going to take place over time. You know? And then yeah. as it gets more developed and people are like, hey, because we've been hearing for years that you can't get Iced Earth merch anywhere. Well, we know that. So we're trying to – JSR had a site for a while, but it was nearly not functioning. So we're trying to promote this and turn it into something so that I won't feel so – nervous about okay i'll i'll spend uh 10 grand on making a bunch of cool stuff and just warehouse it knowing that eventually it's going to sell you know and th that kind of stuff i don't want to do right now mm -hmm. we need to build it up that makes sense man uh john baylor asks what is your opinion on modern traditional metal on modern metal he said he says modern traditional so i'm guessing modern I mean, that sounds like the old i don't know <laughs> I would need an example because I don't know what he's talking about, actually. I'm not sure. I would have to hear. Uh, well, I'm sure there's examples. And then there's the other side of have I heard the music, you know, so yeah, I don't. Yeah. That's the other thing I'd have to. Maybe if, if there was a the band name, then I would know something and I could expand upon that. But I don't really know what he means. So we, so we flip the question and maybe say, what, what is your opinion on the modern metal scene? Is that, is that an easier mm -hmm. <laughs> question to answer? <laughs> I mean, that also is like, what would be considered modern metal? Hmm. I don't know. You for, know me, like, for me, it's bands like Parkway Drive, Architects. Slipknot? Dude, that's who I would consider modern. Yeah, but they're mainstream. They're like, they've, they've been going for a bit. I'm talking about newer bands, like modern. I only saw uh, part of a video of Parkway Drive and you know it's they sound really good and i know we're 
they're headliners at Bakken too next year. So um, maybe I'll see them. I'm not sure what night they're playing. I know we're on Friday. I don't know about the other bands yet, but uh, I, it's not really my cup of tea, but they're good. You know, they, they sound good. You can tell they got attitude and it seems like they believe in what they're playing. So that's, that's a big deal, <laughs> you know? Uh, but I, I can't do I guess I just am not the right guy to, yeah, to yeah. cause I don't spend enough time listening to it. You know, I'm yeah, not going to, yeah. I'm not going to devote my time. I don't listen to very much music. And if I do, it's typically stuff that, that I, um, grew up with, you know, or if it's good friends of mine, or if it's like a, a band that I, that I'm going to blindly buy their record, no matter what, like Iron Maiden, um, I would still even buy a new Kiss record if they ever make one. I know they won't, but if they did, I'd buy it, even though I pretty much would know it's going to suck. I'd still buy it, you know, just because I'm a fan. So it's like, it's one of those things that there's, there's a few that I'll do that with, but it's, I don't spend time listening to the new stuff because I don't really care. You know, I, I do this for a living. It's, it's like, I use the analogy if you're a carpenter and do you want to come home and work on your house in your off time? The answer is no, you don't because you do that all day at work. Well, I'm, my whole world revolves around music and the business of music so it's it takes some of the fun out of discovering new bands you know i do every now and then but not like when i was a fan it's different that's that's fair man that's cool uh christopher ellison asks would you consider doing a something wicked part three uh well i have plans for the something wicked story that are pretty different i'm not going to get into it right now but i can tell you that that is definitely not over but mm -hmm. is it likely to come up in the subject of a new iced earth album i'd say probably not you know i i don't see i don't know how many more iced earth albums are going to be but i don't know that i'm not feeling that right now you know i'm not feeling that uh uh any desire to take the story further in terms of an iced earth concept record but the story is not done and the, the medium that I'm going to do is something pretty unique and I've got plans. So, but it, but it's the thing is what I, what I've said for, for a long time concerning the something wicked thing is when I, when I do that, when I take it to the next level, it's going to be the thing. So I can't do it halfway. And that's going to mean that it's going to pretty much be when I'm done with the music thing for, you know, when I, when I wrap iced earth up, um, then it'll be, that'll be the time to go further into reaching the real potential of what something wicked can be. So I, I, um, I think we, uh, we had a discussion on, on the group about this in, in, in particular. Um, and I said, I said, uh, I said the healthiest, the healthiest thing for the something wicked story. This is my personal opinion. Um, uh, the healthiest thing is to go move away from music and, tell the story in a different medium i think is the best thing that's just me it's your story man do what you want but that's just my opinion um, it doesn't mean that there may not be a song that'll creep up here and there that have some relevance to the story just like on dystopia or plagues works, or what yeah. but it's not to do a full record i know it's very unlikely i have other plans i've had plans for many years on this it's just that i know once i start this it's going to get big and it's going to take time and it's going to take time that i can't i can't do everything that i've I have way more creative ideas than I have lifespan to do them all. <laughs> and so I can't, I got to juggle, man. <laughs> I got to juggle the, the things through and you know, I've got partners, you know, my partner in demons and wizards, my brothers in iced earth. And I don't want to let them down by doing too many other things. And, um, it's, that's going to be the something wicked thing will continue and it's going to continue after iced earth. Cool. Uh, that's, 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 I'm looking forward to that already. I'm not looking forward to Ice of Envy. I'm just looking forward to things there. That sounds really awesome. Uh, I can't believe, these people's names, man. They always have hard names to say. Z Z Zidros Virgos. I'm, I'm sorry, dude, if I pronounce your name wrong. They ask, any chance of doing some work with Matt uh, as, a, as, as a guest singing alongside Stu? Uh, I mean... I'd say that's always possible. And I, you know, Matt and I have talked and we, we talked about it on his departure that someday we're going to make music again, but whether it's going to be under the banner of iced earth, that's very unlikely unless it was to do some kind of a special thing. And we have not talked about that, but I'd say it's not off the table. I mean, I, I love Matt and you know, he's got a 
great voice. Obviously, uh, his his uh, he is firmly planted in the history of Iced Earth, and it would be a cool thing if we choose to do something like that. I think he would be up for it. But um, I, so, but there, but that's it. You know, it's just there hasn't been any plans made or anything like that. It's just a. I think th they say it's in the world of in the in the realm of possibility. Um, and Matt and I making music together is absolutely in the realm of possibility later. You know what I mean? Probably when the, at the point when I start is finished. So. Cool. Uh, Andy Lloyd asks, uh, what, what was the most challenging song to write in terms of riffs and composition? Um, Well, by saying writing, I'm going to say that that, not, that doesn't have anything to do with performing because some, some, uh, uh, some of the hardest stuff would be like when I wrote When the Night Falls. Not hardest to play, not necessarily hardest to write, but those are, those are very challenging guitar parts. Uh, Dante's Inferno is loaded with challenging guitar parts. So is Travel and Stygian. Um, there, a lot of the early stuff was very challenging to play because um, – being a young buck, that's what you're doing is you're filled with fucking testosterone and you're like wanting to, ah, you know, how many riffs can I put in? Ah, you know, it's just, it doesn't really have anything to do with song necessarily. It has to do with, you know, having balls this big. It's, you know, that's, that's all it is. And when, as you grow as a songwriter and start to develop things more, you know, not just uh, from a musical standpoint point, but from lyrics and vocal melodies as well, then it's, it's an evolution process. And I would, so, but those songs weren't hard to write. They're hard to play. So that's different from a compositional standpoint. Um, I would say maybe Gettysburg was, was one of the, it was the hardest, but not, but it, it came very naturally, but it, it was hard. It was hard to, to, uh, tell that story because the orchestration parts are crucial in that song without the orchestration it's not, not going to work. It's, it's, it was built that way from the very beginning. Um, so all of those movements, you know, the stuff that I did on a keyboard, you know, not knowing how to play keyboards, but having, uh, I mean, I can basically any instrument that I pick up, I can create parts on. I don't have to know how to play them. I'm not a keyboard player, but I can get in front of a keyboard and make stuff happen. And it's the same thing with, I broke out my mandolin the other day since the first time since horror show and recorded uh for this big rock epic that's like it's more like a classic rock epic that's going to be on the demons and wizards record and i i played the mandolin on the uh, phantom opera ghost and in the intro and outro and i haven't played that it hasn't even been out of the case since 2000 or whenever that shit was recorded maybe 2001 for horror show so i got it out had my tech restring it and I played it and it was like, man, this is cool. You know, I haven't done this in a long time and it's a very prominent part on this song. So, uh, that's, but getting into those, those parts in Gettysburg, it's the complexity of that whole arrangement to try to tell that story. Uh, that was, would be one of the most complicated compositions by far lyrically, musically, the or orchestrally, you know, I was coming up with those parts with very basic pat now the samples that you can get nowadays of actual choirs and string sections and everything are amazing. The quality is spectacular, but back then they, it wasn't so great. It was okay. But I so I would come up with these movements and thinking that, Oh, this would be a cool melody for the brass to play. This is cool for the string section. These are cool choir parts or whatever. But then, you know, when I started working with an actual arranger, a guy who, that, who took all those ideas and he said, now nah, that's, that is a woodwinds part The you know, in, in the way music theory is done, you would never have brass playing that melody. That's going to be a woodwinds part, you know, that kind of stuff. And I'm like, okay, well, whatever, as long as the melody's in there. So he took the parts and assigned them to the actual orchestra. So when we went to the Prague Philharmonic Orchestra, they were playing stuff, you know, but it, it was a lot of work. That's what I'm saying. That's short answer. Gettysburg. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That was a short answer. <laughs> short answer means long answer. Bill, Bill was right. When you get your talking, you do go, you do go off. <laughs> yeah, you, well, you do, you do the show for us. It's cool. There's a lot of detail, man. That's the thing, and I, yeah, yeah. I see what I see. The thing is that people, 
Um, and is it detail anybody cares about? I don't know. But people make they they come to these assumptions based on almost no real information. So I'm trying to give people this is the way it is. This is the deal. This is how it works. And it's, it's well cool, man. I love I love this shit though. So it's all good. It's all good. Uh, my bruv Ulysses Hernandez asks. Uh, well, he says and asks. He says he states and then asks. Uh, obviously, the Greeks are the best crowds and the most hardcore fans they've had. Is that true? Uh, it, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I don't want to shit on the rest of the fandom, but yeah. Um, and it, and it, not, it shouldn't be that way because we do have an amazing audience everywhere, but there's just some special thing between Ice Earth and the Greek people, and I don't really understand it, but I'm very thankful for it. It's amazing. You know, they, they have a, there's a deep, deep passion there. And it's been that way since the beginning. It's not, you know, from the first album on, they are like, we just didn't get there until the Dark Saga album cycle, but it was already happening. It was a, a big thing, and it still goes on today. So thankful yeah. for that. Yeah, he says that, and he, he asks, uh, has there been any other fans throughout the years that have stood out to you other than Greece? Uh, well, I mean, yes, there's been a lot. We've had, we've had amazing shows all over the planet. Germany is a big deal for Ice Earth, too. I mean, Germany is like a... It's, it's your biggest market, right? is our biggest market and it's also uh generational at this point and so that we've had amazing shows in germany i mean some of my best memories go back to germany for the first tour with blind guardian that we did and, you know when we the first show we ever played in europe was in hamburg and the people were uh we did three encores i think that night you know they wow it's insane. They wouldn't let us leave. And the guys, and there was guys, in a, the Blind Guardian obviously was backstage. And then some of the guys from Halloween. And we're, the first time we're standing there, like, they were doing Tsugabe, Tsugabe, Tsugabe. And we didn't know what that meant. And uh, it was uh, one of the Halloween dudes was like, what are you guys doing? Get out there. They want more. That's Encore. Go. And so we did it. And we ended up doing it three times. And I remember the look on Blind Guardian's face when we came off that last time. They're like, you know. And then they had a great show too. So everything was cool. And we were living on the bus together. So I'm like, damn, I hope it goes well for them because otherwise it's going to be pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> but it did. They kicked ass. Both bands kicked ass and destroyed every fucking night. And we, the bond was sealed, you know. So it was good. Uh, that's awesome. Where am I? I've lost my man. Um, Simon Pfistein, uh I can't that's his name but he's he's from bloody bloody times Do you know who they are no that's the john uh, greeley uh, john, new john, project john, john greeley works with him uh, on, on on the little project okay. uh, well he he asks um one show with all singers of each era of the bands could that happen um <laughs> it's ridiculous but could it happen <laughs> uh no it's 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 possible that we may do some recordings with singers from the from the band history. That's a possibility. Could be an awesome way to farewell. Um, but you know there isn't anything planned like that. And then going out and and doing, I you know there's there's a lot to that, man. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's anything's in the realm of possibility. But um, I would think more of a, a studio thing is more realistic than doing a live thing. No. But who knows? Uh, what am I? Uh, why do these people have such hard names to pronounce? It's not fair. Um, uh, Joshua, I'm not even going to pronounce your surname. Joshua asks, um, is next year going to be a full Demons and Wizards tour? Or is it just, is it just uh, festivals for now? Well, we're doing the festivals and then we are working on some dates in the U.S. that that's a, not 100% set in stone. Prog Power is. That's confirmed. Um, but the, the rest of the focus is going to be on the new record. And there's going to be, you know, that, that's the first quarter of the year is all about the new record. And then we got to get prepared for the summer 
And then when we come back, I hope from the summer, I hope that we are in full blown mix and master mode. And, um, and that will eat up, you know, some of the rest of the year, then Hansi and I'll have, we'll, we'll have press to do. We have all kinds of shit to do. And then, um, we, we will be having a new album cycle happen in 2020. So the touring potential of demons and wizards, and that really depends on how everything goes is more on 2020. Cool. If it happens. Cool. Uh, we're, we've just reached the three hour, 30 minute mark, John. Uh, how long, how long do you want to, how long do you want to pull this out? <laughs> I mean, you can ask me the questions, man. I'm good. Uh, I've put my phone on mute, so <laughs> let's see if my uh, my partners are happy about that. No, it's okay. <laughs> go ahead. No, because I looked at the time, I was like, oh. <laughs> Do you have a lot to go, Jason, or are we almost there? I don't know. I'm like, I haven't been counting. Are you insane? <laughs> just, dude, just ask them. I don't know it's too much. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, Saul Montagu asks, do you approach writing differently with Stu than with Matt than with any other singers in the bands that have been in the bands? Uh, no, I mean, I, I don't because the, uh, th now how they react on stuff is different for sure. Mm -hmm. But with my part, when I'm doing a co-writing thing with any of those guys, it's really the same. It's, um, my way of writing when it's one of my songs. Okay. So whatever that might be, Gettysburg, uh, watching over me, whatever. I mean, it, I've written a lot of Eistro stuff by myself, meaning music, lyrics, vocal melodies, the whole deal. Um, if I'm co-writing with one of those guys, it usually means that it's a piece of music that hasn't spoken to me vocally. And it's the same thing, like, I, like I'm coming up with a cool arrangement, but I'm not hearing vocal parts. Like it's not an immediate thing. If it's an immediate thing, better believe that that's gonna be my, a song that I'm writing because it's, it's in my head. If it's just a cool piece of a, of a music that I feel like, man, this is great, but I'm not really hearing anything specific, then that's when I'll co-write that and share that with somebody else. Um, that's also the same thing with with Hansi. You know, I typically don't hand him songs that I'm hearing vocal parts for because those are I'm going to want to keep for myself because there's a reason that I'm hearing it. So that's the that's the uh, the difference and what Hansi brings to the table he brings many things to the table in our partnership but he when it comes to song creativity his way of approaching vocal melodies is his way it's very very different from my way where Matt and Stu is much more in line with my way of doing it than Hansi would be so we create the Frankenstein's monster we create Frankenstein's monster by I'm giving him the musical compositions to go with the soundscape and then lyrically they we can work together on those he may do one completely by himself he may like the working title that i've come up with and decide to run in that direction whatever that might be however it ends up um but mel melodically that's where the thing happens you know when hansi puts his his way of writing vocal melodies is what makes it a demons and wizards thing over my compositions, my musical compositions. So that that is the thing. And then lyrically, you know, it's, it's not really quite as important who comes up with what lyrically. We can um, we can both do that, and I'm very fast lyrically. So I, it's okay, whatever we do. I've been the songs that I've been feeding him, and I've sent him like ten now, I guess. Um, I have come up with working titles that may end up being used, and they may not. But it does help me when we're talking about the the songs know which one we're talking about because I'm creating a title based on what I think the music, the landscape that I'm seeing in my head. So I have one called dark side of her majesty. I have one called distant warning, um, new dawn, um, timeless spirit. Like I've got, these are titles that I've created for sessions that the music feels that way to me. So that's what I've called it. When Hansi gets it, he may, he may like the title and want to go that direction or he may change it completely. And that's fine. I don't, I'm not married to any of it. You know what I mean? It's just a, a way for me to be able to catalog the ideas so that I know, okay, that's this session, you know? And, uh, <clears throat> but that's how our dynamic works. Mine, if the, if the music, if it's a lyrical concept that I know I have to write and a, 
and the vocals melodies are speaking to me right from the very initiation of the song. And when it starts going, then that's going to be one that I'm going to write by myself. And if it's something that, you know, I'm not hearing it, then I'll work with another or with a singer on that. And then, you know, maybe I'm even helping lyrically when it comes to that. But like, there's been a lot of that in the past where Stu's come up with the melody parts and then him and I will write the lyrics together. You know, it, it just depends. It's, it's kind of different on whatever song. They, they all, I just do whatever, I always do whatever feels natural in that. Um, I, I have a quick question, you know, kind of extend, ex, an extension from what you're talking about. Um, do you, how do you kind of like separate the ice earth vision from your brain and the demons and wizards just kind of focus? Because obviously you're chasing the vision of ice earth. That's been 30 years odd chasing that vision, but you're working on demons and wizards. Is there ever a case of, you'll write something and think, man, that riff is really, that'd be really cool for an Ice Earth song. Or is it, no, this is demons, all demons. How does that, how does that, how's your brain work in that regard? And, and it, again, it comes back to what is, is the vocal speaking to me? Right. And because if the vocal speaking to me, then it's definitely going to be, it's probably something that I won't even hand in to, on, to Hans to work on. I won't send it over to him. Um, yeah. But if it's a, uh, if it's something and in the moment, that's what I'm focused on. So if I was writing Iced Earth right now, um, it would be the songs that I'm not hearing vocals. I'd be sending it to Stu saying, hey, check this out. What do you think of this? Are you vibing on it? Are you feeling something? You know, there's a, I've got a couple pieces of music that are killer right now that I'm really close to sending to Hanzi. But I I think I'm going to keep them for Sons of Liberty because I'm hearing the, the vocal and it fits like with what I titled them. And there is going to be some more Sons of Liberty stuff. And I am going to do like a... Um, a remix of the first album and the the uh, EP, and then maybe two or three new songs, and make a, a double vinyl and put it out on Ravencraft. You know, I mean, they the Sony wants it, so I'll I'll probably do it. It's just a question of when, you know, and then, and maybe during these writing sessions, I'll go ahead and knock out some more vocals. So there's a there's a you know some of that stuff goes on. Like there's some things where I go, that's that's a Sons of Liberty song. I can feel it in my in my core. You know what I mean? Or that should be better off suited as Iced Earth because I'm hearing a specific vocal thing happen. And but right now my focus is demons and wizards, and it's it's always fun to do this because Hansi's going to guarantee going to take it into a completely different. Even if I do have vocal ideas, if I send it to him, he's going to take it in a completely different direction, which is always neat because it's like wow, I would have never thought of that, but that's awesome, you know, that kind of thing. So it's cool. Yeah, have uh, a lot of people are looking forward to it, man. Like, yeah. there's, there's loads yes. of people. Yes, the hype is real. I, I guarantee yeah. that. <laughs> I know. Um, uh, Aaron Philpot asks, uh, um, will any of the material from the album based on Australian ab abori? I can't say that word. Original. Hmm. Aboriginal. Yeah, that's the word. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> mythology scrapped after Nine Lemon in favour of Glorious Burden ever see Black Day. I didn't know. I didn't know anything about that, so I don't. Uh, actually, I he's talking about. Well, that okay. The idea was to use some world instruments on. See, originally the Something Wicked story was going to take place after Horror Show. Then nine eleven happened, and you know we the whole everything got shaken up pretty heavy. Based on lies, whatever we know, there's some dodgy stuff with that whole story. But at the time we didn't we were all being pretty naive about it and trusting what we were being told so regardless the emotion was very pure and and very real and that that's where that album came from but it did shake it up enough shake me up enough to where i changed direction but what he's i i was in australia and i bought a bunch of uh world instruments over there i bought you know some killer drums from pow pow new guinea from like headhunter tribes and I bought sitars and I bought like um, didgeridoos, which are the Aboriginal instrument, and I and that stuff was used on Framing Armageddon. Eventually, there's there are parts that are used on that record, um, you kind of all over the place. So whoever that is, if they want to hear any of the world instruments that I would have been talking about, it was they were used on Framing and some on Crucible, but Framing is loaded with that stuff. Coolio. Uh... It's very really hard to see um, any questions we haven't covered so far. Uh, um, this is a cool question. 
any oh, wait that's, that's not a call it's, you've already rec re recorded that song anyway Steve Kolef asks any chance uh, any chance uh, the re-recorded Dante's Inferno will be with an orchestra I think he means the re-recorded Burnt Offerings if we get it uh, with an orchestra no orchestra. Uh it, no, because the, the costs are simply too high. And with the way everybody steals music, I had somebody ask me that, um, will you ever do anything like Gettysburg again? And I said, and, and it was, the thing, it was at a meet and greet on this last one, the incorruptible tour. And the, before that question was asked, a guy said, um, well, I, ha I didn't buy your new album, but I've been listening to it on YouTube. And I was like, all right, that's great. And, whatever and then the, and the dude uh next to him said are you guys ever going to do another thing like gettysburg where, where you use an orchestra and i said no because of what that guy's doing the guy's <laughs> i can't wow. I can't. i can't go and the guy's look on his face was like oh and i said sorry dude but that's fucking real do you think i can go pay a 65 piece orchestra to record stuff when you know 60 percent of our fan base are streaming shit off youtube you know, and not paying to buy the records. We can't do it. It's, the production costs are simply too high. So, no, that's not going to happen. And especially when I can sit here with a keyboard and I have these amazing programs that have real recorded musicians playing real recorded instruments, I'm going to use that because guess what? I buy the software and I can do it for free right here. And it sounds pretty fucking awesome. So why would I do that? You know, you guys start buying records again, man, we'll start making big ass productions with real orchestras and all that stuff. But like, no, I'm not, there's no incentive uh, for me to do that. Sorry. <laughs> people, word, people, word of advice, support physical media for one vinyl, 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 cassette, 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 please. Cause that'd be great. And if you aren't doing that, if you're stealing music or just streaming it and not paying for it and you, you go to a meet and greet with Vice Earth or Demons, whoever, don't walk up to John Schaefer and say, yeah, I streamed it on YouTube. Yay. Yeah. No, don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't. Please. Oh. <laughs> don't. <laughs> it's like, it's just the, the rea then, uh, you're going to ask me a question like that, I'm going to give you the straight answer. It's just what it is, man. You know? It's true, though, man. It's true. Yeah, it's making, really records isn't, making records isn't cheap. And uh, it's... You know, doing those kind of productions, man. I spent a lot of money in the past on those big budgets, for sure. It's killer to do it. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. But in today's world, it's not realistic. My my band's been going for five years. And we've, in that five years, we've recorded, like, three songs. <laughs> and that and that was on the cheap. And it's just because we can't afford the, like, you know, we, I think we we we, uh, we asked a studio in London that's really, like, highly rated studio in london like held they're held quite highly i forget what they're called and we were like oh we want to record a 10 track album and they went that's 20 grand for like a two-week session we we're like what? we'll pass i think um because <laughs> there's no way we're gonna get that money there's no way no and you know it's like i still i have i own a lot of my own i own my own gear I, mean, I can make records with everything i have but i spend a lot of money on the equipment so even though i don't have to charge myself you know 150 dollars an hour to do an album here mm -hmm. i still have and i have salaries to pay when people are here working when i have engineers here i have overhead costs i have all the overhead of buying this equipment you know so it's albums cost money it's not a cheap mm -hmm. thing to do yeah it is cheaper in some ways than it was in the old days now because Pro Tools is awesome. You know, for, you can abuse the shit out of it, but you can use it at, to your advantage when it comes merely rewind time back in the old day with tape was was like a deal. You know, you would spend mm -hmm. two hours of your day rewinding tape and waiting for it to lock up. If you're doing 48 tracks, when you had two tape machines synced up together, uh, there was a time where the technology wasn't there to make them lock really fast. So you have, you have the time of the rewind, then they're, roo, 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 and they're, they're reading each other's time code and then they lock up and then you hit play. And then if the guy fucks up, then you got to stop, do it all over again and hit record again. And it's like, so that's the, that's the thing. I mean, you could, you could punch in, you could still cheat like hell back in the old days on tape. There is no, I got to get it in one take bullshit. You could punch everything in back then, just like you can do today. But the difference is, the rewind time and that's a that's a big thing with the with pro tools you hit the space bar and boom you're done and by the way so you guys know um whenever we're doing pre-production of course we're cutting and pasting around whole sections because that's when you're deciding on the arrangement 
but we never do that when we we record the real way. Every single those, my my guitar parts are not cut and pasted. When I'm playing a verse, I'm playing it through every single time. We're not cutting. We do cut and paste lead vocal parts when it comes to a chorus to, in order to preserve the singer's voice. Um, yeah. But the thing is, like if we're doing that in a chorus and we're pasting around a basic performance, then we're adding in harmonies at each time the chorus happens so that it gets bigger and bigger. And that's just there's no sense in having the singer sing the same thing over and over and burn his voice out and hurt potentially hurt production. You don't have to do that, especially if you're going to have um, if you're layering it up to where you're having backing singers and everything then you're adding in harmonies and the dynamic is changing every time anyway. So I don't see any point in putting a singer through the grind, like having them sing. And even back in the days of tape, you could still fly a chorus in as long as the tempo was right. You know, if the drummer's moving all over the place, then you can't do that and you would have to perform it every time. But if you're playing to a click and the, 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 even if back, you know, if you had a drummer uh, like Phil Rudd from ACDC, who's solid as hell, you know, th that guy, his tempo, once he locked in, he was there. So you didn't have to do those that kind of trickery. But some drummers don't do their job, which is keep, keeping time. <laughs> Sometimes they're all over the fucking place. And then, Isn't that most drummers, though? Um, well, <laughs> yes. Not me. The, the good Actually, ones I'm don't, pretty shit. It's all right. <laughs> the really good ones don't do that. Uh, yeah. I can tell you that's one of the things I love about jamming with Prater, dude. Fucking machine. But a human... He's a human machine, you know, he's yeah, yeah. that human groove factor in there. Uh, there. It's, it's awesome. I love seriously, jamming. Seriously, man, we, we could talk about production for fucking hours because there's something I brought up in an old in a previous episode. I think I might have been with Mark, actually, about what I call fix it in the mix. But it seems to me modern bands now want to get basically get recording as cheap as possible do as little as possible and expect it to sound as awesome as possible at the same time so what you'll get you'll get bands that are not performing on point they fix it in the mix and they add samples on everything mm -hmm. and it just sounds like it's manufactured bullshit it just doesn't sound good so you, you know you're not because what 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 I, when i when i recorded my stuff the engineer was really pushing me to get a performance so obviously I'm the drummer, I'm the background, I've got to get it nailed in, like, you know. And it took a few times, as it does, but like I'm not the kind of person that will go, Oh, let's just fix it later. You know, just chop it out and just Oh, let's just put all the kick drums to a click and just fix it that way. No, I've got to be on on point regardless. Right. I, I just don't like bands that I just like, you, you know. You hit it the key the key thing to what you're saying is budget. And that's the problem with a lot of the a lot of bands don't have the money to spend on a recording because of what people are doing. They're stealing music or they're not paying for the, the product. They're not yeah, so yeah. the band they don't have the money. So you have to the, the cool thing about that is that with the technology that we have today, you can do uh, really fast recordings and they can sound pretty decent actually, you know, compared to the old days. It's not it's different. Uh, and you can do if you're especially if you're experienced, you can do stuff fast. I mean, with with the purgatory songs, the only reason that was able to happen in nine days is because the level of experience that me, Jim, Mark Prater, and Ruben Drake brought to the table. Like I that's why I knew that not to take away from Gene or Bill, but they haven't been doing this constantly for all these yeah, years. Yeah. That's yeah. so I knew that if I get these guys involved, it's gonna go fast because they're they know how shit works in the studio. It's like boom, you know, they they nail it because they've been doing it so often and are comfortable there. It's if you haven't done it a lot, you get nervous and you know, you don't know. And, and I wanted to definitely spend a lot of time working with Gene, you know, focusing on that kind of stuff. So it's, it's a, uh, th that's why I was confident that we could pull this off in the short time that I had a nine day production, you know, that's a lot of work in a short period of time, even for five songs to do. And, but I knew working with that caliber of session players and stuff that we were going to be able to get it done, you know? So that's, but anyway, that you're, you're right about a lot of that, that modern it's, it's a look, there's a lot of consequences to this behavior of this entitlement society that we have everywhere in the West. Consequences are bad 
on what it means creatively for the future of music, but what it just means to culture in general. Because when you have people that feel like they deserve something for free because they exist, then you have a society that's moving into a very lazy, non-productive society. And so the, the ramifications of this whole entitlement attitude, which a lot of people have now, um, it's never good, man. I mean, this is, this is a cycle that's been going on with humanity for fucking thousands of years, and it's, it's not going to change. So things usually get very, very bad before they get better. And that's, that's where I see us headed because you, we've lost – the, and not all of us. I mean, we, I think a lot of us have a good work ethic, but there's a big segment of the society that doesn't. And they feel like they deserve free goodies because of what? Why do you think you deserve that? Why do you think you deserve to not to have something handed to you? Why do you think you deserve something that your grandparents didn't have? They worked their fucking asses off. You know, you look at the World War II generation. Those people worked hard, man. They suffered. They went through a lot of shit. Now what? We... We, we deserve something because why? Why do you think you deserve something? You don't deserve shit. You have to earn. You have to fucking work. You have to set goals. You have to achieve those goals. Nobody owes you a motherfucking thing. Nobody. So get off of it. And that's the shit that we're faced with. And it's happening. I'm just saying my, the music business is a microcosm of what's happening in the entire world, in the society. So it doesn't go anywhere good. You know, that's all I'm saying. Bottom line is... For everyone that's listening, bottom line is, if you think you deserved anything, get off your fucking ass and earn that shit. That's right, man. Stop being a pussy. Fuck that. Stop being a pussy. <laughs> there's a lot of things I like to do. I just have, time's a problem, though. If there's a lot of things you want to do in life, time's an issue. Because time isn't. is time is not unlimited, unfortunately, for us humans, which is sad. That's absolutely right. More questions, sir. Go ahead, man. We come so. I don't, I don't think we've had out of all the people we've had on this show, like you know, hell, Matt Barlow was a was a big episode for us, almost four thousand views, massive episode. Yeah, we've had Matt twice. We've had you know, you, you've seen you know Larry Janowski, all these names, and I don't think an announcement on our Facebook has blown up as much as getting you on for a second time, John. So it's ridiculous. No, no, no problem, man. I mean, look, you know, I, I haven't seen, I've seen a few of the episodes that you guys have done. I did watch Bills, which was awesome. I just like whenever it's in the, the, uh, my field of view, like mm. I trying to think of who else I's, I've seen. I've seen a couple of them. I haven't seen all of them. And, uh, but you know, that it's, it's cool. You know, it's, it's really a cool thing to be, I, I'm okay with doing this. Like I would never give normal, I told you that before. I would yeah, never yeah, give, yeah, yeah normal journalists this kind of time because you know dude it's they're just, robots man <laughs> well, it's very stock stuff you know and i mean yeah. I, have, I have a couple journalists that are friends that that i'm cool with you know but mm. i'm not typically a gigantic fan of journalists to be honest with you but this is more of a discussion that's that's for the fans and they can actually get to you know i can go into depth on these answers if they want to know and some people do some people don't give a fuck you know some people are more interested in just reading sound bites but the problem is when when I do a half an hour interview with somebody and they edit it down to one page or a half page or two pages or whatever, a lot of times the real intention of the discussion gets lost because it's not all there. And that's that's what's cool about doing this. So anybody that really cares enough to to want to watch an Ice Earth podcast is probably a, a fan enough of a fan that really wants some serious information. So mm -hmm. I'm willing to, I'm willing to spend that time with you guys every now and then. It's no problem, man. It's a it's I cool appreciate it so much. Yeah, I, uh, it means the world, man. It does. I appreciate what so, you're doing, so it's, it's all good. I have a funny question. Uh, I can imagine. I can imagine what the answer is going to be. Uh, Christian Fernando Cerna asks, "Can you give me a guitar lesson through Skype or FaceTime? How much?" Smiley face. <laughs> um, <no. laughs> I, I I knew it. I should have bet on that answer. Damn. Uh, oh. Uh, this is a cool one. Uh, Andrew, Andrew that, I have to actually learn how to play guitar myself, and I just don't have time for that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can't do that. Good to know. Uh, <laughs> Andrew Edwards asks, if you could jump into a time machine and go back and start from scratch, again, using the knowledge you have now, what would you do differently? 
Wow. That's a, that's a loaded question, that is. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't... I yeah. don't know. I don't the know al- that I... What's the album's, that? I was going to say, the album production would be a lot higher. <laughs> Probably. Yeah, uh, but but that only comes from wisdom and from doing it. You know, that that's the... There's no Nobody's born out of the gate knowing how to make records. You just have to yeah, keep yeah. doing it until you get it figured out. And so... Even those things I wouldn't want to change necessarily because they were part of the learning experience. And that's the that's the whole thing about the entire journey has been a massive learning experience. I don't know that I would really change anything. I mean, I could say I wouldn't have signed a record contract that bad that with that those kind of points. That's you know, but then again, we may not have gotten signed. So there wasn't it wasn't like there were labels beating down the door. There were Mm -hmm couple labels that were interested in the band um but being from florida at that time when everybody in the indie label world was signing death metal you know we felt that we were pretty lucky to have interest and it had to be a european label because you know combat records i think they were interested in the very beginning and then they folded and the, the girl who was running the label really wanted to sign a band, but then it, it all kind of fell apart. And uh, uh, Road Racer, which at the time was Roadrunner's division in North America, they were interested in doing a license type of thing. But um, it just felt like with Century Media, that was, that was going to be a, a thing that they, they still, because metal was still, melodic metal was still, viable in europe it was still big and since they were a european based label i ju- i guess we just sort of felt like it was going to be the better it was more of a commitment you know for because it was a longer term deal it ended up being a lot of slavery and we didn't have an attorney that was able to handle those kind of negotiations but we also didn't have any clout and you're a baby band so you're gonna you need to take what you can get just to put it out there which is what i was being advised even by the morris brothers by tom he said look if you don't do this, you may not get a record deal. And at least if you get this, you can put it out there and see if there's a reaction. And if people like it, then, you know, you can carry on and renegotiate and maybe things will go better. But this is an opportunity to get a product out there with somebody who's willing to, you know, they wanted like a 10 album commitment then. And it felt like, well, this isn't much money, but it's a, it's a start. It's a, a, a doorway into the business. And that's, that's why we did it. So Having said that, you know, maybe I could have played hardball ball a little more and had the terms be better. But I, that's, that's probably one of my only things that I would change because the rest of it's been a, an unbelievable learning experience. I have more knowledge about the music business and the business of music and um, how to make shit happen than anybody I know, to be honest with you. Like I can when I put my sights on something, I fucking make shit happen. And it comes from, I mean, I've been doing that since I was a kid. Okay. That's, that's the, that's a, I have a very strong willpower, but now it's like with so much experience and focus and there's that I can really bring a lot to the table with, with that, you know, that, so that experience, all of the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it has been uh, school, man. It's, it's like going, you can't get an education like this by spending four hundred thousand dollars in a university like there's no way this is this is real life shit going through it experience step by step and i'm so in that regard i don't think i'd really want to change very much at all if i could go back in a time machine to a period of history then i'll go back to the american revolution and i'll be fighting you jason oh no. yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, no that's my favorite that's my favorite period of history so i would definitely want to go back there and kick some uh kick some british tail but you know hey other than that i'm all good <laughs> if you uh if you draw your sword on me make the good the good god strike you dead yeah the same i've heard that somewhere yeah, yeah I, I've, I, I, it's, it's, it's from a really famous song i, I can't remember the band i can't remember what they're called mm. yeah, the rose. yeah. <laughs> Sounds of roses yeah is that what you said the rose. i said the rose Oh, the rose. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, where am I? I've lost where I am. Aha, here we go. Um, uh, Remy David 
I can't pronounce these names. Uh, these names are... You, guys, everyone's killing me with these names. Anyway, Remy asks, In the last Quebec City show in March, John mentioned that maybe a proper live recording in North America could be done. Is this still a working idea? Yeah, that's definitely a possibility, man. You know, that's it's a... Because there will be more... You know, live records don't mean what they used to either. Another, It's another thing, like, to to do um, a live album or another live album again. The cool thing about doing live albums is that they don't cost that much to make. So, you know, it's not, it's not such a big deal, but I know that like they don't also sell very much anymore for anybody. You know, live albums are typically are not a big selling thing. It may be um, that somebody shocks us and comes out with a live record that ends up being like kiss alive and, you know, wow, shock, you know, or Frampton comes alive, which is a, was one of the biggest albums of all time in America anyway, uh, back in the early seventies. I mean, there's, there are some shockers that happen like that every now and then, but, you know, but regardless of how much it sells, there will be, uh, a, a market. There is a market for a live album from iced earth. And we've done a lot of great records since our last one. So I think, um, the, the chances of that happening are good. And I think if we did it in North America, Quebec City could be a great place to do it. They're great fans there. Amazing. Will fest will festivals ever get a vinyl release? Um, I doubt it, man. I think that that release sucks, actually. So I don't. Oh my god! Yeah, so I, do I. See, I, I <laughs> love it. I just wish that it was one complete show instead of bits of the three. I just wish it was a whole CD of a regular show. You have that's no my... Well, they were festivals, though, so I don't think the sets were ever really that long. So I think that's probably why it was what it was. But I'm not a fan of the of the entire product. It's one of those stopgap okay. things that happens, and I don't think the performances are really good. I don't think the sounds good. I don't think there's anything very exciting about any of it. I just Thank think you. it. Like, Thank you so I much. I love the cover. I felt so good with the hate in that release, and now you've just admitted what it is. <laughs> my 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 main my main argument for that for that release is, I I think whoever chose the the the, uh, the performances, the one with Tim, I just don't think Tim sounds good at all in that on on that festival DVD or yeah, just. I disagree. He's an incredible singer, but I just don't think he's very good on that personally. That's me. Well, I mean, who knows? I I don't even remember. Like I, I think I probably the last time I heard that was when it, I was like, yeah, okay, it's mixed, it's done, <laughs> and then I'm done with it. <laughs> I have no, like, I don't sit around and listen to it, but I don't listen to any of this shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, don't yeah. Want to, I listen to a record right when we get it finished quite a bit because it's happening and it's like, okay, that's done. And then from that point on, it may, I may not listen to it for years and years or when I have to relearn a song, you know, something like that. But so. <laughs> that's still funny. It's funny that we have the same opinion. So I, for me personally, I have no desire to make a vinyl of Festivals of the Wicked. Okay. Essentially. He wants to do that someday. They can. They have the rights to do it. They may want to do it, but I'll, I, I'll still buy it because <laughs> I have to have all the vinyls. Yeah, but I, I don't as, put any time into it personally. No. As completionists, we just I would like to see festivals and melancholy on vinyl. Melancholy is a possibility. Um, that, that is a possibility for an EP release. I mean, I don't see why not. Uh, when who the fuck knows but it is that's a possibility <laughs> because you know it could be a cool limited thing like the original melancholy was i don't know was it 1500 or 2500 it was a very limited amount of copies they I were think it was 15 1500 yeah and then they then they mass produced it didn't they after that for from a fan demand yeah they did but the but the original hand numbered ones are probably pretty valuable i would imagine they they they're hard to find the cheapest one that i found on eBay that uh, was about 40 pounds which is i don't know 50 dollars something like that yeah and i didn't want to pay that so i didn't uh next question okay, is question. next question is from someone i think you may know this person because his name's kevin Keane. do you know kevin Keane? yeah i do yeah. i haven't yeah. seen him since the old old days but well yeah. well he asks well he says <laughs> he asks and says uh <laughs> since greg seymour didn't know where is my BB gun, and when do I get to write your life story? You promised me. <laughs> okay. The BB gun? <laughs> Woo! I don't know what happened to that little piece of evidence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Greg told us about your shots. Shots fired. <laughs> no, 
Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, he was young. Young days. Young John shooting the place up. <laughs> Dude, you know, it's like uh, we did a lot of dumb shit back then. So, yeah. But I, yeah, Kevin, I have no idea where your fucking BB gun is. No idea. It's been a <laughs> long, long time ago. And as far as writing my life story, you know, my life ain't over. So let's don't write it yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jason Lacey replies to Kevin saying it's probably still in the attic at 8603 North 15th Street. Oh, that's a possibility. We may we may may be up there. That is that is a very real possibility because that was our escape route. And I'm sure we were like, what are we going to do with this? This is the evidence. So, yeah. Uh, Tony Fabretti asks, I'm sure it, he says, I'm sure it varies between the albums. But in general, how many tracks of rhythm guitar are recorded in a song and what microphones are typically used? Um, I, I record eight tracks of Whoa. rhythm. Um, That's a stack, that is. It is a stack. And it's the, the whole, the reason that I started doing that was um, to try to create, you know, when you're recording, you're creating an illusion, obviously, of uh, what it might be like with standing in front of a band. But you can never get that feeling out of a three-inch speaker. So I, the, the idea was to stack the rhythm guitar so that you could mimic that feeling of your pant leg waving when you're standing in front of your cabinet. Now, of course, you can't do that. But you can create the illusion of that by stacking up rhythm guitars. The, the key is you have to be a tight fucking player. It has to sound like one performance. And that's where... A lot of people get in trouble with that if they're not really consistent and they can't do it. I can do it uh, very efficiently, usually in one take, you know, so I go through it. I knock it out very fast. But um, it's a it's in, in the old days, it started to, you know, again, to make the guitar sound heavier on a small speaker. When I, before I had my Larry amps built, uh, the Marshall is a much cleaner sounding amplifier. So. And we would even run it cleaner, knowing that by the time I got to like that fourth stack, it was starting to really thicken up and the distortion was kind of smearing and it was go it was going into a cool place. Um, I, it started off doing like four and then I went to six and I've been doing eight tracks uh, probably since uh, Dark Saga, I guess. Um, and that's the typical now. Having said that, on Framing Armageddon and Crucible of Man, I went completely insane and I did 16 rhythm guitar tracks of every, every fucking part. So, and then the, the uh, lead guitar parts were like eight, you know, it was, I was on a stack fest. I mean, I'm like, fuck, I got the technology, let's do this. You know, so I went crazy and I was doing all of the experimenting with uh, soldering in different pickups into different guitars and, dude, I was doing so much experimenting on those two records with tones and how to build and stack, um, you know, 16 rhythm guitar tracks is pretty ridiculous, but I did it and they were all fucking performed live. There was no cutting and pasting on that. So I was driving Jim a little bit crazy during those sessions. Cool. That's why they sound, you, your guitar always sounds thick as hell. It does because you're, you don't have the in live. You have the, uh, you have the PA system, you have the back line, you know, you can't get that. So how do you get that to make a, a band sound huge on a three inch speaker? Yeah. It's one of the ways, you know, it's one of the tricks. My, the microphones that I use are, are, uh, varied. So I, that's kind of part of my secret. I'm not going to divulge that. I, I have, I've, it, I've spent a lot of time learning how to, to, uh, get my guitar sound to trade, happen. Trade secrets, guys, trade secrets. Yeah, uh, ancient tiny secret. Tiny secret, huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, next question. Uh, Andrew Edwards asks, with the exceptions of the neck injury, uh, are there any other injuries you've you've obtained over the thirty years of playing? Well, I have tendonitis. Um, I had snapped my bicep tendon um, in my in my left arm working in the warehouse in right before I flew over for the promo tour of incorruptible. So I was, I played 90 shows with a torn bicep tendon. Um, so yeah, fucking, it, I was, just, I was in a lot of pain on the last few tours, but I soldiered through it. I got cortisone shots and it's, you know, 
it's not, it's, it's, there, it's, there's a two parts to the tendon. So it was one of them snapped and it was weird because I was lifting a bunch of heavy shit by myself. And it, it happened when I went and did the stretch, I just did this and it went bam and it was loud. I heard it and it felt like I got shocked by a, a really gnarly electrical volt. You know, I just got nailed but it was the tendon snapping and my arm blew up and I'm training with my, uh, doing the Wing Chun training with my Sifu. And he's like, dude, you need to get that looked at. You're a guitar player. I'm like, yeah, I'm not sure what happened. I heard this really loud sound and fucking it hurt like hell. So he's like, you really need to, he got out his anatomy book and he's like, you, I think based on what it looks like here, this, this is torn. So I went and had an MRI done and sure enough, it was torn and, uh, just snapped. And I, the surgery was too brutal it would have risky um so the doctor said let's see how it goes you know it, it can it can heal uh but it's going it's not going to function the same way so um i'm dealing i'm dealing with that you know the, the tendonitis comes to, to a lot of athletes and stuff or people that do repetitive motion so i've been battling that in my right arm i think there's a little bit of that in my from the picking the way i picked for all these years and i think there's a little bit of that in my and my left arm actually from uh, the tendon snap because now my soft tissue in my left arm has to it has to relearn how to function to make up for what's been lost. So it's it, he told me it's like a year and a half, two year deal, um, but it's it's a pain in the ass. But you know I deal with it. Hardest working man in metal. I, I'm saying I keep saying it, man. Like that just proves it to me that you're hardest working man in metal. Like that's fucking ridiculous. Um, Torn yeah. bicep, man. Holy shit. Well, I don't, you know, we, I can't, uh, it's gotta be really, really bad to cancel shows and to let people down, whether it's my own team or if the fans or whatever, it's gotta be like a, I'm not going to do that unless I got to be on the operating table or something like with the, with this neck surgery, that was risking being paralyzed. It really got to that point. And I was told that by the doctor in Germany during the plagues tour, he did the, the treatments that I, that I had done on that. And he said, look, you're you're really running the risk of potentially being paralyzed one wrong move and this could really be bad so i'm telling you go get the surgery done sooner rather than later i finished up the tour but we had to cancel the festivals and i had the surgery in july instead of september so i was trying to push it to the end of festival season but couldn't do it but that's the only time man i only cancel stuff and if it's really really serious and i could still play I mean, did it hurt like fuck afterwards? Absolutely. <laughs> did it, was it really hard to tie my shoes sometimes? Absolutely. Did I need the guys to give me a hand with things? Absolutely. And did they? Fucking A, they did, because they love me and they're my brothers. So. Yeah, but like, like my body shuts down if I stub my toe. You're talking about fucking torn bicep. Like, come on, man. <laughs> yeah. You are it's... you are a machine, sir. <laughs> Metal, dude. Stop. Got to hold your arm. Yeah, pussy. Yeah. What's the face of metal? This guy, John Schaefer. <laughs> John yeah. Schaefer is 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 metal. Anyway, I'm gonna stop my nonsense. Um, it's over, and any we miss, we'll try to get them. Hopefully next year. This is uh, the last question of the day. Uh, what were what were um, Douglas Rosanda asks? What were your amplifiers on the first two Ice Earth records before the Larry Head? Uh, Jubilee series. It's the let me show you. See that silver Marshall? Mm-hmm. That's yes. that. It's that. It's not that amp, but it's that kind of amp. It's a okay. uh, the Jubilee series. It was twenty five year anniversary Marshall. It's actually uh, the amp that Slash ended up using too. It's his thing, and whenever you see a Slash signature amp, it's basically a, it might be modded a little bit, but it's the twenty five fifty circus the circuit the uh, Jubilee series. Um, it was a battle. Uh, it was a real battle on the first couple of records playing um, those kind of parts with that t type of amplifier. It was really hard and it was frustrating. And, um, you know, I, I was really grateful when Larry reached out to me and once, you know, we'd already recorded storm rider cause we were on that tour. Uh, even though I had talked to him on the phone a year before that, but when we finally met in person, he was building my circuit. It was a it was a blessing. It's almost like he could feel what I needed when he heard it. He flipped out on my rhythm guitar style, got in, like I told you guys, got in touch with the studio, and then he's like, "I know, I know what you need. I want to build. I got to build an amp for you." And and we we worked on it, and we've done some tweaking through the years, but very little. And uh, it's 
makes a makes a big difference. It's a lot more fun to play when you're not battling. You know, when you have a tone in your head and you're fighting because you don't. It's not the tone that's happening in the amplifier. It can make your uh, performance suffer a little bit, or at least maybe maybe you're still executing shit killer, but you're not having as much fun because you're battling it in your head. You know, one of those things. So yeah, uh, when when uh, when my band was recording, uh, I I like a particular snare sound. So mm-hmm. trying trying to like get my snare tuned to the to the correct tuning, and then placing the mics in like all different points of the snare to get that right attack and right you know sound took like almost an hour took ages but when you find it you're like you get in yeah it's important to be comfortable i mean sometimes you don't have that option you go out on a stage at festivals and you've just had a line check and you're playing in front of 60 100 people or whatever and if you you just have to you have to fucking suck it up and do it because you're a lot of times you're going to go out there and that's, this is where having a good crew is really important because even if they've only got a 30 minute changeover where they've got to set up the back line, get everything mic'd, test everything, make sure things are working. They, they're not able to do a proper sound check. They're doing a line check, make sure that they've got signal. So then you really need to have a sound man and a monitor guy that have your back. Monitor guy is really important because that's what we hear on stage. It's not what the audience hears, but it's crucial for the monitor guy to know what each musician needs to get their gig on. You know, I need to hear Brent. Brent needs to hear me. Both of us, as long as we have each other, we don't really need to hear anybody else in the band, but that's the, that's the key thing for our mixes is Mm -hmm. to, to get through at the bare minimum. Of course, it'd be nice to hear Stu. I don't really want to hear the other stuff because it's Brent and I need to be like this. And that's why it's the, that, that he's dominant in my mix and myself. Um, but I want to hear Stu, but I don't have to hear Stu because I know the songs well enough. It's all, it's all about being able to being comfortable that you have the minimum of what you need to do to pull off your gig. Um, that's different than being super comfortable and going out and having a sound check and spending, you know, the crew spends three hours building the stage and getting everything ready for the band. And then we walk up and we make a few adjustments and then, then we're done. You know, we can take our time with that. When you do festivals, you can't. So sometimes you just have to eat shit and smile. And, you know, and on festival stages, that's that's the way it can be. Isn't, is, isn't that life, though? Doesn't life always make you eat shit and smile the majority of the time? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Don't don't want want to smile. Smile. With, with that, with, with that lovely note, we're going to uh, we're going to wrap up this lovely, lovely conversation. Uh, yeah. Everybody, uh, thank you for watching. Uh, I have been Jason. I've been joined by, as always, with the incomparable Chuck Hoskins. Chuck, thank you for joining me once again, as always. It's awesome. We have been joined by the master of the Gallup, the one and only John Schaefer. John, it has so been... Gallup. I'll put that on my tombstone. The master of the Gallup. Yep. No, I won't. That's Please not do good. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's, that's, that's Thanks fact. for your time today, John. We appreciate it so much. Yeah. Means the world, it. man. All right, cool. Everybody, thanks for watching. Stay metal because metal lives, my friends. See you later. That is a wrap.